Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the case may be. For all of you listening out there across the crazy planet Earth, welcome to Vestiges After Dark. And I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, coming to you live from the deep woods of Western Georgia on this March 7th, 2023. Tonight, I get to play both your host and the guest <laughs> because we're going to be doing archetypal readings tonight, okay? We're going to talk about archetypes and their importance and how we develop them, how we identify how they make up who we are, or at least who we think we are. And uh, we'll have some time to look at some of you if you're daring enough to come on the show and let us analyze your archetypes i think we can at least do maybe two or three people from the audience um, i'll put the number up on the screen when we're ready for that but uh, in the meantime just sit back relax and get ready for three hours of interesting conversation Good evening, everyone, or at least those of you on the West Coast, <laughs> or the East Coast, rather. Good evening. I guess it's mostly evening everywhere now in, in, in the United States, but uh, I know we have a lot of people out there that listen uh, in Australia now, so I guess it's a good morning to you. So, <laughs> Father Chris, I don't believe, is joining us for this episode because he still has obligations, but I think things will go back to normal with his schedule uh starting next, next week. week so i think so. you'll have him for the rest of the season after that but tonight uh we're going to be doing uh an extremely uh fascinating study on archetypes and i'm really looking forward to doing this with you in fact i actually put out and i'd like for those of you who might not have noticed it um if you go to our youtube channel it's still it's still up there we put it out day ago um and go over to the uh nicolaian tv page on youtube and click on community you'll see there's a poll that i put up and only a handful of you um actually answered it but it's giving us some insight into i mean that's uh, we got 15 votes so it's hardly a sample population out of the 1.04 uh, thousand followers we have however uh i think you know it does give me some some insight into what it is that you all want in shows for vestiges after dark and what we're seeing here is that 47 percent, at least out of everybody who's voted so far we'll check it again next week hopefully those of you who didn't know about it can go there and vote yeah now. i just happened upon it did you afternoon. yeah if yeah. you don't if you're not looking at your feed on youtube you might have missed it if you don't go to our community page on youtube you might have missed it i didn't really advertise it anywhere else it's just on the channel on youtube but there's a poll there and it shows what kind of episode do you like the most and it asks if you like episodes with new guests episodes with returning guests open lines open topics and educational episodes with bishop brian speaking on a specific topic like we are tonight um and 47 percent so far we'll check it again next week but 47 percent so far have said so almost half prefer open lines open topics and i kind of know this because i've looked at the ratings i've said this before and our most popular shows the ones that have the largest volume of listenership is open lines open topics so um i think i already knew that but uh i want to get an idea because getting guests on a show can be very complicated <laughs> problematic they don't answer emails um even when you think you've got them they're still kind of elusive and uh you know spacey so it can be kind of difficult so um i would 
like doing, I guess, <laughs> less shows with guests and just kind of sticking with our returning guests. 13% prefers episodes with returning guests. 40% uh, prefers episodes that are educational with me speaking on a specific topic. And nobody so far has voted for new guests. So <laughs> I guess that works for, for our little problem here, our little conundrum. But go ahead, check that out. Go to the community tab on our YouTube channel and um, log your vote so that we know what to focus our attention on. And I'd like to get more than 15 votes there so I can get more of a sample population that will help me, okay? Um, but pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go into probably season, I would say season eight is probably going to be more of the open lines, open discussion. and Yeah, maybe uh, we can go to the chat and, uh, you know, at the end of an episode and see what topic they want to talk about the next week. That could work. Give us some time to prepare, get some background. That could definitely be um, something we could do. Yeah, there's lots of ways to approach this. And honestly, not having to get guests on the show every week would be, um, uh, well, less work for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, and speaking of, you know, getting less people on, the, uh, you know, less people on, um, the, the deck we're featuring tonight, uh, which is going to be coming up on the second segment here, okay, uh, is Nick Bantock's Archeo deck. Okay, you can get this on Amazon if you're interested mm -hmm. in having one for yourself. I found this, I think, at Barnes & Noble. And um, I was immediately captivated with it. I'm going to talk more about why. Um, some of you probably already know why. Some of you might not know why. Um, but it fascinates me. Archetypes are one of my fundamental, um, I guess, fields of study. Uh, it's what inspired me to get a degree in psychology and it really became a of paramount interest throughout all of my career. Um, and it works perfectly in both um, psychology and religion and even philosophy as well. Um, but I asked, I spoke, I, I reached out to Nick Bantock and asked him to come on the show and talk about the deck. Um, he was very uh, nice and very courteous and said that uh, he thanked me for the invite, but these days he said he prefers to focus on creating rather than explaining things. So he didn't want to come on the show, um, but he did give me his blessing to use the deck any way I see fit, which is exactly what we're doing tonight because I created, I developed rather a um, unique spread um, that is unique to me um, that we're going to be using for the readings tonight when we do readings. And remember, these are not psychic readings. These are going to be archetypal readings. And I'll explain also in the second hour what that all means when I preface what we're going to do. And then Jamie Wolf can be the guinea pig tonight to start Yay. us off. <laughs> and honestly, Brandon Milam, who's here also with us, uh, he can also be a guinea pig too if he wants to stick around for the full three hours and just stay on. Um, but that's up to him. But right now we're going to bring him on for our uh, segment on uh, questions and comments from the ether. How are you doing tonight, Brandon? Good evening, Brandon. Doing fantastic. Great. Great. So what do you have for us tonight? <clears throat> so we got some more interesting questions, and um, all of them are from the network. And the first one is from Danielle. For someone who really wants to get their teeth back into the Bible, which version would you recommend? I always answer this the same way. And I, I, in my opinion, there's only really one that you need as uh, if, unless you are a native Greek or Hebrew speaker where I might have a different answer for you. Um, and if you speak fluent in Latin, uh, I might have a different answer for you, but for the average person, um, I just say the new American Bible is the best um, because it is, based on some of, and I have one right here, actually, it's based on the, some of the best sources, um, which of course the church of Rome would have, um, considering that, uh, you know, they would be the authority on this, everything that we consider. This is the funny thing about people who criticize the, the Roman Catholic church. It's like, okay, I understand all the criticisms, but you know, you, you can't dispute the fact that the only reason you have a Bible today is because of them. Um, uh, because you know, it all comes from their study, their work, and they were the ones that preserved it for posterity so that we can use it today. There would have not even been a Protestant reformation if there had not right. been such dedication of the Roman Catholics to preserve scripture and of course the Orthodox as well. Um, but, uh, the real 
meat of the effort, you know, the Vulgate uh, from St. Jerome's Bible is kind of the, 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 the precursor to everything that we use here in the West. So the New American is a wonderful uh, Bible with good sources, um, good manuscripts that it is based on, and the translation is as simplified as it can possibly be, trying to keep and preserve the original spirit of the intention, but also not lose the reader in, um, you know, an overly scholarly approach to the subject it's um, it's still pure in the sense that uh, you, you you're reading it as close as you can in your own language in the in the english language um you know uh, but you know not losing some of the spirit of that original greek uh, that uh, that was contained in the original uh, manuscript so that's the only one that i recommend there's other ones that by the the, the, the catholic church um uh, has several that it uh, endorses, but the New American is the one that's also used in the United States for the lectionary. So if you're watching our masses on the uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, if you if you're into our masses and you like that particular feature, um, the readings that you hear at mass uh, and from the Divine Office are all from the New American. Okay, so that's the best one for. Even even for people that are very familiar with the, with the scripture, it's I, I still say it's the only one I use. Let me put it that way. Unless I'm having to do some kind of research into something with the original language where I want to compare and contrast certain um, passages or something, uh, if I'm just reading the Bible to read the Bible for my own spiritual nourishment, it's the New American is the only one I use. And it's this one right here. This is the one I've had this since I was a little kid. This Bible, it's falling apart, um, but it's the only one that I need, and it's the only one I use, and it has um, the best, I think, translation. So would you not recommend, like, the, the King James, or it's better, the New King James version? The New King James isn't too, too bad. The, the Orthodox Church actually uses the New King James. I have one of those, and it's got some good, there, there's some good versions of that one that uh, has some excellent commentary in it. Um, so the new King James is very different, I think, than the, than the one that is used in like Baptist churches and stuff like that. Uh, the King James though, the, the standard one is just uh, horrible. Um, they didn't have the, the access, the, the Roman Catholic church didn't allow them the access to, um, some of the best manuscripts. So they had to use copies of copies of, of subpar versions, uh, in order to be able to produce that. And there's some terrible mistakes in the King James that, uh, you know, of course, proponents of the King James will say that it's practically God speaking directly, but of course. Um, <laughs> it, it's far from that. And uh, it's not a good translation at all. There's lots of problems with it. And um, I would say stay away from it because it's just not complete. It's very much a politically motivated uh um, translation. And as you know, from your own life, anytime something's politically motivated, it does not bode well for you. Nope. Um, I think we have had more than enough experience in that in the last few years to know that that is a absolute truism. So uh, I don't care if you're talking about science or you're talking about Bibles, you know, if the politics is driving the motive behind it, uh, stay away from it because it's usually garbage at that point. And yeah, I, I'm going to say it. The King James Virgin's garbage. I think I have the new revised standard. That's not too, too my, bad. My mom got it for me when I um, converted to Catholicism. It's not too, too bad. The, the so, Catholic Church doesn't tend to use I enjoy that. It. But, but the New American, I think. Got it wrote down right here. Yeah, That's that's what we use at, at Mass. And um, it, it really is, I, I think, the, the best uh, example uh, for an, an English speaker <laughs> to use. Okay. Yep, there you go. What you got? What's what's next? I think that answers the question, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So this next question, uh, if you can go as in depth as you want, but uh, on the surface, what the differences between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam? Can you explain how we essentially worship the same God? Well, they all are Abrahamic religions, so each of those whether it be Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, traces their um, ancestry, their spiritual ancestry back to Abraham. Okay, so it all starts there with him. So pretty much everything Abraham and before 
all three religions for the most part agree on okay um but when it comes to the um sort of the developments that's where you start to see deviations and changes so essentially what happens is the same thing that happens with all around the world i mean the same thing happened with hinduism as it as buddhism buddhism evolved out of it okay is that somebody starts out as that parent religion and in this case judaism is the parent religion because it is the first example it's the first one there was a time where judaism existed on its own and there was no christianity and there was no islam you know judaism was around for thousands of years before christianity mm -hmm. and islam didn't come around for 500 600 years until a a after christianity so um you know islam's a fairly modern religion when you think of it but what they all seem to have in common of course is is fundamentally that it all comes back to abraham okay so um the god of the hebrews is the god of of the christians is the god of the muslims and sometimes people will get mistaken because uh muslims will refer to god as allah and think that that's a different name for god no it just basically means god um and if you go to the middle east and you uh encounter christians in the middle east because there are arab christians believe it or not um there are uh, semitic christians the church of jerusalem still exists <laughs> um the church of antioch still exists mm -hmm. uh, there's orthodox churches out there that have semitic people um even in the roman catholic church there are eastern catholic churches the melkites are uh, are middle eastern christians and uh all of the prayers use the word Allah. And it shocks people when they hear this because they think Allah is, an, is, a, is a Muslim thing. No, it's not a Muslim thing. It's just the, the, the Middle Eastern word for God. Um, and it's, that's all it is. So, um, but it is the same God, okay? The, the, the difference is, is that when Judaism into Christianity, Christianity um, recognized Jesus as the Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for. So when you look at what, Judaism is all about. Judaism is about waiting for a Messiah to come back and reinstate the Jewish people and um, and bring them back into the 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 uh, I guess a theocratic control of 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 uh, Israel um, that they don't recognize, or at least some of them don't recognize the secular government as being valid in the sense that it's not um, what the, the Messiah would be coming here to do. But Christian, Christianity evolved out of those Jews who recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they're saying, no, this is who we've been waiting for. Traditional Jews said no. The, these avant-garde uh, Jews who became Christians said yes. And um, most Jewish people didn't take to it. But the people that did take to it were the pagans. Mm -hmm. So the Greek and Romans... Um, they were very interested in this thing called Christianity, this individual called Jesus, and they could relate to it. And so Paul focused his attention on the Greeks. And, um, and, and so Christianity took off in the, in the Greco-Roman world, whereas in, in, in the, the Jewish world, it was very subdued. And even to this day, same thing. Um, so they, the only difference really between Judaism and Christianity is that Judaism does not recognize Jesus to be the Messiah that they're waiting for, where Christianity says, yes, it is. And you're not going to get another Messiah because you missed this one. Islam is basically saying you both got it wrong. <laughs> um, they, that, that because of years and years of corruption and Paul wanting to put his own twist on things and the apostles taking this, the, the message of Jesus and twisting it because Islam sees Jesus as a legitimate prophet. They're just saying that his, his uh, disciples uh, contaminated his message and turned it into something that it was never intended to be. And so, um, God, Allah, um, sent the angel Gabriel to a new prophet, Muhammad, um, and gave him a direct word for word dictation as to what this correction 
needed to be, which is what the Quran is. And so they're saying that this is God fixing all of the errors of the Jews and Christians. You kind of see this in like any time a religion evolves out of a previous one. So like I said, uh, Hinduism was the older religion. Buddhism evolved out of it because they saw things differently. Hinduism says there's absolutely a soul. Buddhism says that's where you get it wrong. There is no soul. You don't really exist. You just think you do. And uh, um, so it's a philosophical, ideological difference that creates the, the, the tension between them. But if you were to look at both Buddhists and Hindus, they would still recognize that the, the goal here is, is release. So in Hinduism, it's moksha. In Buddhism, it's, it's uh, the extinguishing, which they call nirvana. Um, basically the same principle, um, you know, in, in Christianity and Islam, you know, you got heaven, you got paradise. Okay. So it's, it's still, the goals are the same. It's just, how do you go about getting there and what the interpretation is that God wants from us, his people, that's where it changes. And I think really what happened, this is my own personal speculation, but there were two deviant sects that not deviant sects, I should say they were, there were two, um, derivative sects of Christianity that broke off in the early church. One were the Marcionites and one were the Ebionites. Marcionites were all, it's all about Paul. Paul's the only thing that matters. We can throw out the Old Testament now. We don't need it. We got Paul. And when you look at what the church evolved out of, Paul was the fundamental influence, Mm -hmm. not the Old Testament. The Old Testament was basically like, okay, well, we know that all happened, but now we've got a new message and let's focus on that. So, the church is very Marcionite in its current form, but the Ebionites disagreed with the Marcionites and the Ebionites said, no, uh, we are still Jews. And in order to be a Christian, you must first be a Jew. Some were even teaching that you needed to convert to Judaism to be a Christian. Mm. Some were saying that if you were Greek and you weren't circumcised, you needed to get yourself circumcised to become a Christian. Um, of course, there was, was actually an argument between um, the early Christians. Uh, even Paul and, and, and Peter had disputes. The Galatians are another example of this where that was going on, the Church of Galatia. Um, so you have, these, um, you have these disputes that are going on, and the Ebionites kind of broke away and basically practiced a very Christianized form of Judaism. I suspect that they did what many groups did back then went off into the desert and encountered other people and taught their message and influenced other people. I think Islam evolved out of the Ebionites. Hmm. That's where I think we get Islam. I think that's what happened. So the, I think the Ebionites went East met up with what became the, um, basically the, the, the Arabs that were listening to this message and, and Islam evolved over the next several hundred years from that. So that's my theory. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on that, but you know, that's, that's how they all kind of connect and disconnect is a, it just comes from people saying that I believe we, we, we believe in God, but you, you just understand him the wrong way. So it's not really terribly different from Catholics and Protestants or, you know, Catholics, Protestants, and evangelicals. Um, it, they're all basically saying, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but you're all, you, you got it the wrong way. You, you got it wrong. Everyone thinks they got it wrong. Everyone thinks the other person got it wrong. So in this sense, what I would say is the closest you get, to, the closer you get to the earliest teaching is usually the one that's probably going to be the most accurate, the best. Okay. So um, what it really comes down to fundamentally is that, do you feel that Jesus was the Messiah? If you do, um, then Christianity is is the religion for you. If you don't, then you probably should convert to Judaism. I don't think Islam has any grounds to work with because it was basically a message that came from one individual 600 years later. Okay. And that's never a good thing because we've got, we've got lots of non canonical texts from all sorts of different extra uh, biblical sources um, from Gnostics and other uh, influences. And it's very clear when you read some of these, like the Nag Hammadi is a very good example. Wonderfully yeah. beautiful, symbolic and poetic and philosophical, but not good religion. It's not good religion. 
Okay, the you know the Gospel of Peter with the laughing Jesus, faking his crucifixion just for the benefit of our, you know, I mean it, it's 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 crazy stuff. Okay, that does that gets away from the original sources. So when you look at the oldest texts, what we've got that make up the Gospels today, what we've got that makes up the New Testament today, are the oldest writing. So you've got the writings of Paul, the epistles of Paul, that goes back to about 50, 55 AD. Um, and then you have um, the gospel of Mark, which is the oldest gospel. We suspect that, that was written sometime in the late 50s, maybe early 60s uh, AD. Then you have Matthew, which is about 60, 65 um, then, you know, around 70, 75, you get, um, you get Luke and then you don't get John until like 90, 95 AD. Um, but when you look at all of these other book, books, like the gospel of, of Peter, you know, um, the, the gospel of Judas, these weren't written for, for hundreds of years later after the, the original Gospels. So I think sometimes when you watch these documentaries and people put this stuff out there and it makes it look like they were all written at the same time and the church decided to exclude those because that has forbidden knowledge and we don't want them to know about it. But no, it's not. It's the reason that they were not included is because they came too late and they, they were clearly already deviations from what the original texts were teaching. So they, in order to keep the religion pure, which was the obligation of the fathers of the church, they weren't going to accept anything that was written that far down the, the road. So get to the Quran. I mean, you're talking like 600 years later now. I mean, come on. All right. So clearly, you know, by that point, people put their own emphasis into it. So, I mean, I guess if you believe that the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad, then the Quran's the, the book for you and Islam's the religion for you. Um, but for me, I don't see any value in, 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 in uh, accepting a so-called truth from something that came 600 years after the truth it's based on. I would rather go with the content that goes back to the beginning. So that's me, but that's how they all connect. Um, Feel free, Brandon, if you feel that there needs to be a follow-up question to that, but um, that's the best way to answer it, I think. So that actually brings up uh, two things. Uh, one of them is when I get into, into debates with people about the differences, like do we worship the same God, Christians, and Muslims, uh, the one thing, and it's just this one thing that is always brought up, and they say, well, in the Quran, it tells them to convert or kill the the infidels, and so they've been using that as their argument to say, no, we don't worship the same God, because our God won't do that, but theirs does. So would you be able to kind of elaborate a little bit more? Well, that? um, that's not exactly what it says. I mean, there's three options, honestly. Um, you, Islam gives basically three. I mean, I'm no expert on Islam, but I mean, I studied enough of it. I've read the Quran to think that I've got some basic understanding of it. So, um, the, the, you know, there's three options. So you can give a, if you conquer a territory, okay, which what the Muslims were big into in the Middle Ages, okay, that's what caused the Crusades, okay, to, to stop, to preserve Western civilization. Um, oh, my goodness. Hold that thought. We've got some fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies coming in right now. Lord, help my um, carnival diet. <laughs> Yeah, bring thank, that over here. You, I, yeah, this is my favorite cookie, by the way. I, I just I love. Uh, and someone was asking our libation mm. tonight is uh, Star Wars. We uh, have had this before. This was a gift from Father Chris, and we're uh, getting through the bottle. We are. Right now, I'm getting through the cookie. Oh my lord! Mm, thank you. Thank wow. you, ma'am. I'll put that right there and get back to my answer. So, um. If I fall out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but I don't eat sugar anymore. So but tell me they're good. Oh yeah. I mean, they're amazing. And my favorite cookies too. Yeah. Other than snickerdoodle. Oh, it's yeah. Well, okay. So, um, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. Uh, you you had read the Quran. To have oh a yes. Basic understanding. Okay. So I think I have a basic understanding here. So basically you got, you got, you got three options when you conquer territory. 
as a, as a Muslim. Okay, you can offer conversion. Mm-hmm. Okay, they can convert and become Muslims, and then all is good. You know, then you're considered one of the family. You know, um, they take you in. You're part of the religion now. Um, you can also pay a tax. You can preserve your own religion and continue to practice it uh, as long as you pay a tax. Now, I have a little bit of a problem with this one because go ahead and try that in Saudi Arabia today. See how well that works out. It doesn't. <laughs> well, hi, Heathcliff. Exactly. And Heathcliff's here with us right now. Of course he does. There's cookies. Yeah. Um, and then if the other two fail, if conversion and tax don't work, then, then you kill the infidels. <laughs> um, and all of that comes back to the Quran. So... In order to, I mean, we don't have to make the assumption that the Quran was written by another God. We just need to make the the assumption or the logical um, supposition that um, the Quran is not accurate. It's just not an accurate um, work that either it was um, made up is one possibility. Of course, they could argue that about, I mean, they do. They argue that about the gospel, saying that the the apostles intentionally twisted the words of Jesus to preserve their own take on him. Well, I could say that about Muhammad. How do I know that Muhammad didn't do that? I mean, so it's a stupid argument for Muslims to have because we could just throw the same argument back at them. So it really comes down to what you believe. And um, no, my God... My understanding of God, rather, not my God, but my understanding of God is that um, killing people because they don't convert or doing any number of other things that some form of or some interpretation from the Quran could present um, is, is contrary to my understanding of the divine nature. So, yeah, if you've got an interpretation of God that is God's going to come in and kick ass and wipe out anybody that doesn't believe like he wants them to, well, then, yeah, Islam's a great religion for you. Well, that's something man does because yep. Christianity had their rough spot too. Oh well, yeah, Christi- men doing the and killing. And Christians used to argue that too. They did. They argued that. They would say, you know, that we could, um, you know, we have to, we have to preserve the, the the Christian faith. And so, if you're Jewish, kill them. I mean, the, the Cathars, the Pope actually yeah. said, um, kill them all. Let God sort them out. That's from the Pope. All right. So the to me, just knowing how men are. Um, this is what proves to me for my satisfaction that the Quran was man-made that has no divine inspiration whatsoever, because that sounds like things that man would put into a book, not something God would. But I don't think we need to assume that some other God, because that would, that would give credence to the story that Muhammad actually had some kind of divine experience for all we know, he was nuts. I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Muslims, but, um, you know, I can tell you my interactions with them have not been positive over the years. Um, sometimes they're respectful to me, but a lot of them have been really nasty with me. So it's like, I'm going to just be, look, you want to be truthful with me? I'm being truthful back. Okay. So if you want to say that the apostles were all a bunch of nuts and they got it wrong, I could say the same thing about Muhammad. I mean, I, I mean, it's where do you want to put your faith? And I don't have a problem. If your faith is that, go and do it. If if that's really what you believe God is like, then I guess if you want a vengeful God, you know, then choose a religion that has a vengeful God interpretation. Uh, I don't have that kind of, of, of opinion of God. My experience with God is nothing like that. So therefore, um, I think the, the apostles actually got it right. <laughs> um, so, you know, and my texts are 600 years older than yours so that gives me a lot of credibility too i think islam didn't come around until the seventh century yeah so you know but that doesn't make it another god or that was written by some or like that muhammad had an interaction with some other god i think it's just you know a very deviant interpretation of what was already out there clearly muhammad had already had uh experiences with christianity but he put his own take on it you know and and that, that's what I think happened. But, right. you know, of course, uh, that's probably heretical and will get me killed in some countries for saying that. So, I mean, there you go. I got you. Uh, <laughs> your, your, your cat, by the way, is being very sweet to me. And this, I know he can't have cookies. No, he can't have cookies. Um, but he thinks that they're for but, him. But you're very cute. He, the, 
He's you, actually putting his paws up on my my thigh and kind of patting my hand, and he he never shows affection to me. So well, he'll do it's it. Very, when, very he'll hard do not it to when there's cookies involved. I, yeah. I mean, I can't be mad at him. These cookies are phenomenal. <laughs> so just one last thing. Yeah, go ahead. That, uh, mm-hmm. going I'm gonna take back, a bite of my cookie so, while you talk. <laughs> uh, right. uh, going back a little bit when you're talking about uh, the Bible and which books made it and which ones didn't. Um, Southern Baptists, we were taught that if the author of a book was deemed to not be a man of God, that the books were not included, what's the truth behind that? I think that's a nice story. Um, yeah, what, what makes them not a man of God? Who, who did makes that decision? That's not how the Bible canon came to be. I mean, they weren't looking at the authors. In fact, we don't even know who the authors were. Um, the names are, pseudo, uh, are, are pseudographical. Yeah. So it was common practice in the ancient world for two reasons. One, it, and if you had a work that you wanted to make sure would be preserved, you wanted to put the authorship in the name of somebody who would be remembered. And if you weren't someone who would be remembered, if you're just like some guy that was writing something down, um, you're not going to be remembered. But uh, if you write something in the name of, of St. John, that you know, somebody who knew Jesus, that's going to get the attention of posterity. So that gives it um, more of a chance of being preserved. And second, um, you wanted to also emphasize that this book's not about me. It's about, it's about the story of Jesus. And so therefore you would name the book after somebody who was um, a direct connection to the person you're writing about, in this case, Jesus. So you would, you would name it after a book of somebody that knew Jesus. And maybe some of these individuals actually knew the apostles, you know, because that was possible. But um, it was very unlikely that they were written directly by the apostles, although it probably was written by, by scribes that were with them. And that they, what they did is they wrote it after the person they learned the most from. So very possible that John, for example, um, taught as they would, and a scribe that put down what is now the gospel according to John was named after the person who taught him that, that those stories, which became the gospel. And so he named it after John, not after himself, because he didn't see himself as important in that. It had nothing to do with whether or not he was a man of God. It had to do with whether or not the information was reliable. So... Um, the text in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, um, it would be decided what would be the definitive uh, teachings of the Catholic, of the Christian faith. What is Christianity? What are we going to say? This is Christianity, and this is not. Okay, we would, and that was what was decided, and so that became the Nicene Creed. Those are the tenets of the faith, and so anything in any of the various. Um, documents from the ancient world that had theology or content that deviated from the tenets of the Christian faith that was established at three, you know, the Council of Nicaea 325 and where they were going with proto-Orthodox theology um, would be thrown out at anything that did reflect what was considered to be the, the truth based upon Holy tradition, because by this point at 325, all you've got is a bunch of documents that some things seem to agree with what you think you know, some things don't agree, and you're not sure what's what, but you also have what was handed down by oral tradition directly from the apostles themselves and to their um, um, to their descendants all the way down the line. And so, uh, you know, you could you could go and say, well, this person knew this individual who knew St. John or St. Peter or St. Matthew, um, does this seem to agree with what he remembers being taught? And if there was something in there that didn't agree, that became heresy. For example, the Gospel of Peter. Okay, It has basically a story in there that Jesus is that him dying on the cross is all just a hologram and that um, there's this guy that's kind of laughing in the, 
crowd while Jesus is dying up there and the apostles come around. I'm paraphrasing here. Hopefully I'm getting it right. I haven't read it in a very long time. But um, the apostles come around. They're like, what's this guy laughing about? And they go over and they see it's Jesus. And he's laughing because he's like, they think that's me up there. Um, clearly, that's a deviation from the idea that Jesus had to die for our sins in the flesh and actually take on the suffering that we would. Um, that's a deviation of the whole meaning of the theology. You change fundamentally everything that Christianity is if you accept the Gospel of Peter as canon. That had nothing to do with whether or not the guy who wrote the Gospel of Peter was a man of God. It had to do with the fact whether or not what was being taught there agreed with what was understood in holy tradition at that time by those who were taught by the fathers of the church. And so once it was established um, that this is what we would believe and anything outside of this is a deviation or a corruption of the truth, um, that's how the canon came to be. And the canon was not established. What we call the Bible was not um, an established thing until about four, the 400s. Um, people think that like, that like the Bible just fell out of the sky one day and it was all complete. No, I mean, it was slowly and carefully. A very long time to put together. It did. And there was a lot of text that didn't make it. A lot it. of arguing back and forth. Yep, because there were there were. There were Different communities and different churches around the uh, the area that some had by a community preference liked certain books more than others, and the Didache was one. There's nothing um, theologically wrong with the Didache. Uh, it's just it, it just wasn't considered to be enough of a, a, a an inclusion to say well this needs to be in the New Testament. But there's nothing wrong with the Didache. It's actually an old book. It goes back to the first century. But uh, it's just not canon because it just didn't seem to provide anything that we couldn't already get from the ones that were included. So I'm sure the people that saw the Didache as canon were disappointed when it wasn't chosen. Um, but there was a time where the Didache was considered by that local community to be sacred scripture. And it wasn't universalized until the church became more centralized into one authority, authority uh, one governing body that would uh, decide this definitively, this is what Christianity is and this is what it's not. But, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how the canon came to be. Uh, you brought up one more thing uh, before we get to the last question. Yeah. Uh, since the books typically were not written until 50 or so years after the events of the resurrection and they used oral tradition, uh, back then, how accurate was oral tradition? Exceptionally so, because they didn't have computers, and writing was very expensive. Paper was extremely expensive. The average common person could not afford it. So um, you didn't have things you could preserve and write things down to remember. You didn't have sticky notes and computers and recording devices. You had to be able to depend on your own wits and so um, it was because we use that part of our brain more so than we do today. Um, you know, we people back then were exceptionally talented at being able to remember knowledge like that. So um, when you look at some things that were considered to be oral tradition, which you do find in some of the writings of the fathers of the church, like Irena Irenaeus and Tertullian and, uh, uh, Tertullian and, and different um, other writers that teach things about the faith that would have exceeded or ex stepped outside of the boundaries of, of things that were, that were um, in scripture, you do find that they are referring to things that are oral tradition that then later came out in other documents that were uncovered for hundreds of years later. And you find that it matches their understanding perfectly. So um, oral tradition was pretty good. Um, and, you know, it had to be because that might have been your only method of holding on to data. Today, it would be horrible because we were, our brains are weak. We write everything down. I can bear, I can't even remember my phone number half the time because when do I ever have to give it? It's all on a phone. I just push a button 
and then there it is. You yeah, know, I can remember my parents' phone number from forty five years ago. But not because the one we had today. To know, we had to memorize stuff as kids. That's right. And but I do. Now, I but remember. now I'm like, what's your number? Yeah. Um, hang on. I got to look it up. I don't yeah. call myself. I remember <laughs> like, my grandparents' yep. phone number when I was I uh, a kid. I remember yeah. my, my, my home. I remember my dad's two work, my, my dad's two offices. Yeah. I remember wow. both of them. And I could recite that today, but I couldn't tell you my dad's phone number now. Yeah. Because I'd ever have to use it. I just push a button and it calls him. Or I don't even have to do that. I just say, hey, Siri, call my dad. <laughs> you know, um, so that weeks, uh, that weakens our mind. It does. And so that would distort our understanding as to how powerful oral tradition would have been. Because we really can't fathom how good memories were back then at, uh, compared to what they are today, which has become very weak. So, um, yeah, nothing really wrong with oral tradition. It's been proven time and time again, even in non-religious sources, that... Oral tradition's been pretty good, pretty re, uh, reliable. There is yeah, a quick... I, I, Go ahead. I, honestly, I find it incredible, the... Because, like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I remember my uh, phone's home number because we had two home phones. Mm -hmm. But anything else, if it didn't happen yesterday, I don't remember it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's just because we don't need to. And so we're just not using that part of our brain anymore. You know, it's becoming a, a vestigial structure in our minds, honestly, to, to be able to use memory in that way because it's just not necessary um, like, it, like it used to be. We become mushy. I mean, it's just like a piano player, you know. I mean, you, you, you get these master pianists and uh, they don't need to remember anything i mean they, they they can you can give them notes and they'll they'll do it but i mean a real good musician can play these extremely complicated pieces just by memory it's the same thing with uh well you know i'm a shooter obviously with my career yeah yeah it's after after so much repetitive training and stuff you could hand me if it's got a trigger i can shoot it <laughs> and you, usually i can do it with my eyes shut yeah so yeah it's that constant reinforcement mm -hmm. yeah. you don't use it you lose it I, that's true for everything yeah so uh, we did have a question in the chat i don't mean to interrupt brandon but sure, um, no, i actually have never heard of this timothy had a question on your thoughts on the do ray reams yeah that's it? another that's another um uh, catholic bible okay, that one i haven't heard um it's an old i mean it's an older one um it's fine I don't have any problem with it. All the ones that the Catholic church endorses is fine. I just find that if you're a new, per like I think the question was somebody that's trying to get back into the Bible or, you know, was new yeah. to it. Is that what it was, Brandon? Yeah. Uh, somebody's wanting to dive back in. Yeah, yeah. Get back in. I'd say you might want to go with something that's accessible. So the new American is good in the sense that not only is it accessible, not only is it the one that's being used in the lectionary at mass, but it's also the most, um, uh, it has some of the best manuscripts. Um, so, you know, but the Catholic church will not endorse a Bible for use unless it is at least a, a respectable version. So anything that the Catholic church has determined to be, um, a, an acceptable uh, translation is fine, but I just find the new American to be the superior one of them all. That and uh, we are now at our last question. I, I think we have. Yeah, we yeah, got, we we got, got about time. 11 minutes, so we're good. Uh, this is from Tiffany. Okay. Uh, a very good question because I, act, I encounter this as well with uh, what I do. But uh, how often or is it possible for us to leave behind a piece of ourselves in a location that was a source of trauma? And is it possible for that piece to haunt a place even if the person is still living? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's what a created demon is. So you've heard me talk about the four types of demons. Okay, so you've got the fallen angels. You've got the um, elementals. You've got the created, and you've got the wrathful spirits, okay? Um, and I think on TikTok, I'm up to, and I haven't done them in a while, so I'm sorry if you guys are, you know. 29 or 30? Waiting, but 30 episodes? Something like that. 30, yeah. 30 um, lessons, I think. I think we left off at the created. So I think I might have talked about that one. I'm not sure. But the created demon is a thought form or a projection of a person's psyche that is typically a dissociation of a tr caused by a trauma. So uh, when a person suffers a severe trauma, there's two possibilities. 
psychology only recognizes one of these possibilities, and that is this type of pathological internalization, which we call repression. Okay, so that becomes a repressed type of trauma that gets buried in there and then will resurface in unconscious ways through anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, or any number of other ways. Uh, but typically it will come out as some kind of nondescript mental illness. And it's because of a repressed trauma. So you'll often see sometimes with um, children who are abused, they can't remember the abuse, but they have all these, um, all these issues, usually anxiety or suicidal uh, ideation. And they don't know what to do. Um, they don't know where it comes from. And it will take years of therapy before that starts to surface. And they might never get those memories back because they were just too, too traumatic. So psychology has no problem with that one. But what psychology does have a problem with is the other way that this can happen. Some people do not internalize their trauma. Some people externalize through dissociation. And that dissociation can actually create an energy form that can manifest in the external world as a separate sentient being that becomes a new tormentor for them. So if they were abused as children, then this becomes an abuser that continues to abuse them as an adult in this incorporeal form. Um, and it, for all intents and purposes, is a demon that not needs to be removed from their life. Um, so anybody that suffers a trauma if they are a projector, if they're an externalizer instead of an internalizer, can potentially do this if they have enough um, energy to work with. And usually trauma creates a lot of energy. So it's usually the best way to do it. However, there's ways that you can create a, a tulpa, there's many names for it, tulpa thought form. If, if you can create one that many people can see, it's called an egregore, um, but it's all the same basic principle. And, uh, if you, you know, if you have enough skill in the occult, you can actually create one that becomes a, a sort of um, um, uh, servant to you that can do your bidding. And it's somebody that, you know, you can kind of almost like a, um, well, kind of like a, a, a familiar. Um, it's something that you could send out on missions um, there are occultists and that can do this. Make yourself a golem. Yeah, and that doesn't require trauma. It just requires a lot of uh, skill. Okay, so um, yes. And there, and remember, these are all aspects of the individual psyche. So there's, it, basically what you're doing is you're tearing a piece of your own spirit and, and separating it from the source. And when you do that, it becomes its own sentient, independent entity. And that can haunt, but usually it haunts you. <laughs> usually it doesn't go and haunt someone else or unless you are, like I said, a, a, a very skilled occult, practi occult practitioner where you could go and, and send this to torment someone. I mean, sometimes people will create these servitors to, um, to attack their enemies. You know, you know? It's, it's interesting. The, the scene where I had my accident, a motorcycle mm -hmm. accident, I don't remember where exactly it happened on the road I was on. Mm -hmm but my body did. So I traveled that road all the time. And this was months after I'd recovered. I was driving again. Right. I had to go down that road to go to the grocery store. And I knew that I was approaching the area, like within a mile or two. Um, but my body, I got cold chills. I started to shake. Um, so you could feel the energy. I, I almost had to pull over because it was that overwhelming. And I don't remember where it happened, but my body did. Yeah. So when I told my, my uh, lieutenant about it, he was able to tell me the exact location because there was because they went out there like the day after to right. find motorcycle parts and they saw the blood stains and all that. Right. And um, he said, yeah. It happened right here. Right there. Yeah. And that's right where I drove through. And it took me quite a while to get past that. Yeah. I'm not saying I'd created a total, well, but there was definitely trauma left there. It was basically my essence. You could uh, argue that, I mean, I, I guess a materialist would say, well, it's just a subconscious impression that subconsciously you do know where it was, even though consciously you can't remember it, subconsciously you do. And so you're feeling the anxiety of that moment because a part of that area is affecting your psyche that does remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
But I think you could also, a metaphysician could also say, you might be picking up on a, a spiritual energy that was well, left I behind left, there. I left half my yeah. weight in blood. And blood does the, do that. Yeah, and blood I mean, does I, do that. Most of these servitors that people create in the occult does require them to bleed themselves to some degree right. in order to create the entity to do the thing because it's a part of themselves. And the blood contains some of that spiritual energy that's required in order to manifest this. But trauma can do it. Okay, so anger can be its own kind of trauma. You can use anger to create one as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's what they are. That's what this is. So the answer to the question is yes, it absolutely can happen and does happen. But it does, doesn't typically stay behind in the area. It typically will come back. It just attaches back to you because it like attracts like. It knows where it belongs, but now because it's an externalization of the of the trauma, um, now you now it, it just becomes a, a an attachment, you know, just like an actual demon would be, you know, and it will do sometimes worse things than a real demon. Uh, honestly, they they can be the worst ones to get rid of um, because they are the ones that are the most dependent upon the person's or the victim's rather, psychological health. And if that victim absolutely refuses to get better, if they refuse to improve their lives, then there's only so much an exorcism can do. Because the exorcism can break the attachment, but they can keep drawing it back in. Right. And um, eradication, in this case, typically is required on the part of the victim. It's not something an exorcist can really do. They can just facilitate it, but they can't really, it really comes back to the individual who created it. Typically, a, a, a thought form can only be eradicated by the source, typically. It's just like if you're drug addicted. You can go through all the rehab you want, but ultimately, you have to be the one yeah. Yeah. to recover. Yeah, so I think that uh, Mystic, hopefully. I don't, I don't think we're going to have time to get your question unless you want to buzz through it real quick. What is it? Ask. If a being is moving to attack you through another person but fails, can they later come back through someone else as if you meet the same person through other people? A being attacking you through another person? If a being is moving to like attack you through, through another person but fails, can they later come back through someone else as if you meet the same person through another people? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Mystic, maybe put, maybe rephrase your question, put it in the network, and we'll um, be sure to grab it for next week. Or we can take it when we come back from the break. But or we, or we could try that. Yeah. yeah. Or if you could rephrase it, hon. Yeah, because I'm not sure I understand what you mean by I, I'm attacking kinda know you what she's, through another person. I kind of know what she's trying to ask, but I want to be correct. So yeah, during the break, Mystic, if you could just yeah rephrase that, maybe. But, uh, Brandon, you are welcome cool. to stick around for the next two hours if you want to. Father Chris isn't here, and you can kind of be our third, uh, our, our third panel member to talk about the archi archetypes. You are a student, um, and even though you haven't been a student for a very long time, you've, so you've seen that what we do in the Forbidden Truth class that I teach every Saturday uh, online, it's an online class. It's open to anybody who's interested. Um, you know, there is a... Uh, basically, well, how we handle tuition is rather than my charging you a tuition, we have a, a, a pledged amount that goes to the church. And you, you, you make a, a pledge for, there's a weekly pledge, a monthly pledge, an annual pledge. Or you can even make a special pledge to do even more for the church. But um, you make a pledge at these set amounts and then you can become a student um, and they are all archived. So if you can't make the live class, you can still watch it and get caught up. And if you weren't with me for the last five years, you can watch all of the previous lessons going all the way back for five years. It's a lot of material there. Um, and it's all about this type of information, predominantly archetypes. So what we're talking about here tonight is going to be how to utilize and develop these archetypes, how to identify them within yourself. It should be really interesting. So, Brandon, if you want to stick around, you are welcome to. I'd love to. Okay, great. Well, you just sit right, sit tight right there. And um, these yep. archetypes are going to teach you a lot about yourself, particularly about how you let go 
of yourself. This is the hardest part because we, the thing that we try to teach in exorcism ministry is to break attachments, right? But everyone's thinking it's an attachment to demons, but um, no, you need to get rid of all your attachments, even your attachments to yourself, to your very identity. And that's what we're going to be looking at here today. So don't, uh, don't uh, go away. You're going to find out a whole lot more about yourself here in oh a boy. moment. <laughs> we'll be back after this.
Welcome back, everyone, to the second part of Vestiges After Dark. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the Archeo deck. Okay, it's Nick Bantock's new deck. Um, and uh, he's actually got a new one that's coming out, too, later in the year. So you want to definitely keep a tabs on him on Amazon. Look up his name. Make sure you're watching for his new stuff, because I think once you see what this deck's like, you're going to want some of his other stuff, too. He's a fascinating um, artist and really has a good grasp of these archetypes, which we're going to be talking about here tonight and exploring all of you. You'll be seeing more about yourself here in a moment, so don't go away. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Now, let's start talking about this because I'm really very excited. I don't, I mean, I used to on an old show that I did back in the early days of podcasting um, called Eye of the Seer. We used to do tarot readings on a regular basis. Um, you remember Amanda, the space witch, who we've had on a couple times on this show, wonderful friend and guest. Um, she used to be my co-host of Eye of the Seer um, in its second iteration. It's it, it 
went away and came back. Um, and in the second iteration, we would do tarot readings and uh, take callers, and it was really a lot of fun. Um, but that was on Blog Talk Radio, where you have a kind of a set audience, so it was easier to get people to call in. Here, we have to build this show before we would get to a point where we could do stuff like that. But I think um, these are more complex readings, so I think we can probably do at least two uh, people from the audience, maybe three. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I am going to ask that you please call into the show um, and I'll have the number up on the screen and I will give the number over the air um, for those of you who might be listening on Spreaker or something um, when I'm ready. Okay, so don't call in yet. All right, we'll we'll do that probably towards the, the third hour. Here, I want to start to explain a little bit about archetypes, how I view them, how I work with them and give you the background here. And then I'm going to start setting the example by reading Jamie Wolf. And if Brandon <laughs> wants one, um, Brandon will um, also be able to um, get one too in this, in the second hour here. So we'll focus on more about the mechanics of this deck. And I think you're going to really find it fascinating because getting back to what I was saying in last hour, I teach a forbidden truth webinar. Okay. Every Saturday. And what I teach is the language of God. It's an archetypal language. And the language of the divine is a language of symbols. It's a language of uh, reality. Because all of reality is not what it appears to be. You think you understand what it is, but you're not really seeing the truth of it. Because the truth of it is just geometry and vibration. That's it. That has no meaning to your mind the way you conceptualize things, you have to take that data, your, the whole purpose of your brain, okay? Your brain is basically a giant antenna. And what it does is it takes all that cosmic data, all that vibration and geometry, and it converts it into a symbolic language that makes the image of reality what you understand it to be today. So that way when... I look at a camera and you look at a camera, we can both agree that it's a camera unless one of us is psychotic or something and thinks we're seeing a bird. Um, that, that can happen. Uh, but assuming that we're both rational beings and of sound mind, if I look at a camera and you look at a camera, if I look at a desk and you look at a desk, we can agree that these things are what they, we say they are because we take that vibrational geometric data and convert it into a symbol that means something to us. So what is a camera? Well, it's a symbol of capturing images. It's a symbol of preserving the past. And that becomes an archetype that we work with. We are also made up of this too. It's not just the reality outside of us. It's the reality that we think we are. And just as desks aren't real things, they're just symbolic representations of geometry and vibration so are we. The only difference is we're a whole lot more complex than a desk or a camera. There's multiple variations within us, countless vibrations of energy, countless geometric representations that need to be discerned. And, that, and this can be discerned and broken down into hundreds of thousands, if not millions or tens of millions of different aggregate parts. And those aggregate parts are what we call the aggregate structure. Now, science already understands this to a degree because um, we already know that time is relative to where you happen to be at and the gravity that you happen to be around. So if I, if I send a, a, if I synchronize two clocks and I keep one here on Earth and I send one up to the space station and after so many months or years and we go back and we bring the two clocks uh, timepieces back together, they're not going to be synchronistic anymore because time travels slightly differently in orbit than it does down here the closer we are to the source of the gravity, okay? That means all of our particles that we are made up of are all fundamentally brought together by different timelines. Now, think of it like Back to the Future. Remember with Back to the Future with um, um, Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox? And how that entire uh, trilogy was based upon the concept that you as a time traveler, if you make changes, create a, a deviation in time that is different for you. 
but maybe not for anyone else. Okay, that's why they were able to go in the second one. They made one little change, and um, they in the second one, and then they 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 come back to the present, but it's not the present they left because now they've created a new timeline for themselves. Well, all of our individual particles are part of their own timeline, and they all get woven together in the assemblance of what we call a self. And these are each of the in individual aggregate parts. These things, of course, are also just geometry and vibration, but they need to be symbolically represented in a way that makes meaningful sense to the story of what we call reality. And those players are the archetypes. Okay? So you are a product of these archetypes in different variations and different forms. And that's what creates the different personalities and the different behaviors. Okay. So you might have somebody that has a lot of real dark archetypes and you would meet them and well, you might see serial killer and they might be, they might actually be a murderer. Or you might find somebody that has a lot of gentle archetypes and they're basically saint like, okay. It is, they are, a representation symbolically, their behavior becomes a symbolic representation of that vibrational energy. But there's no intrinsic self there. That's where we get it wrong. Because we think that that is who we are. That's not who we are. But you're needing to ask the question is, not the, not, it's not the person who's doing the experiencing. It's the person who's doing the, ob the observing. Who's observing? Who's the one that actually sees the story unfold? Are you seeing it within yourself? Or is there something external from you that's watching it play out? And it feels as though it's being manifested through some kind of identity or some kind of self. Now, these are questions for philosophy that have been going on for centuries. And Hinduism and Buddhism are completely built around these concepts in the entire we talked about the deviation in the first hour between Hindus and Buddhists. One of the major deviations is what Buddhists refer to as anatta. That is the doctrine of there being no soul. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, that souls don't exist because in the, in, in Hinduism, a soul is, is kind of the true self. Buddhist uh, Buddha said, uh, Siddhartha said, um, there is no true self. That's an illusion. And I agree. Now, Christians can struggle with this because their definition of a soul is even more different from how the Eastern religions understand a soul. And perhaps that's a little bit outside of today's discussion. We can get into it later if you want to. But um, right now, suffice it to say that what we need to do in order to truly understand who we are, not so much who we really are, which is basically a bunch of vibrational energy being represented as a person. But how do we measure those vibrations in a way that's meaningful so that we can understand what it is that we're actually doing and be able to utilize it and direct it at something that is cosmically significant? Notice how I didn't say meaningful or towards a purpose because in the grand scheme of the cosmos, these things are also human representations that have no meaning. There's really no meaning to meaning. Meaning is only meaningful if you want there to be meaning. Um, but, you know, I, people are like, well, why did God create all this? Well, why does he need a reason to create anything at all? God creates because that's his nature. He doesn't need a reason. Right? That's the benefit of being God. You don't have to justify anything. You simply do and it is. Which is why, you know, when... The, the Israelites were like, who's this God? You know, what, uh, when Moses was like, what do I tell, what do I tell the people who, what God is telling me to do this? And you say, I am told you to do this. And even Jesus refers to himself in certain places. I am mm -hmm. because it's all you can say. God doesn't need to be anything more than just simply what is. And once we break down our fundamental aggregate structure, then at the, at the, the core, all it is, is what is. Okay. That's what salvation is being able to preserve this energy into some and make it meaningful because as long as it's wasting away through the course of entropy, it's not meaningful. And these archetypes will break down, not the archetypes themselves, the cohesion of them, 
the combinations of them. So, I mean, just for the sake of understanding this, let's just for a moment say that, um, uh, well, let, let's say for a moment that, you know, one person has an aggregate that is 90% kind and gentle, 5% um, inquisitive and 5% cruel. Okay. That's, and I, that's a that's a very basic ratio because these ratios are actually in the millions, so they're very hard to measure. We have to break them down to just core parent archetypes, which is what these decks help us to do. Um, but this is really more of a metaphysical psychology lesson than it is a mystical kind of you know psychic session. I'm not giving psychic readings here. We're not using this in a psychic way. There's a psychic element to it, but it's just the incorporeal part, okay? What we're really trying to break down is how do we measure the different archetypal ratios that make you what you think you are? And how do we get down to the truth of this so that you can develop? Because there are people who have dysfunctional lives, and they don't know how to fix that. Well, the reason that they have a hard time fixing a dysfunctional life is because they don't understand the archetypes that create the dysfunction. But see, they understand enough to say that there's something different from my behavior and who I am and who I want to be. Well, if, it, if you really are your identity, then why don't you just simply become what you want to be? You don't want to be a miserable, dysfunctional ass, well, then choose not to be that. But that's not so easy, is it? Because even if you make a strong resolve to try to do better, you're going to still fall back into the rhythm of your behavior that is built into your DNA because your aggregates have manifested that way. And you have to understand how to work with them functionally and be able to make changes um, along the way but very calculated changes um, and understanding how to communicate with these archetypes is how you do it because each one of these archetypes is a sentient being. You are not, that's what spirit is. You, a spirit isn't one thing. It's like, oh, my spirit. You're not one thing. You are countless things all combined into one organism. That's why you're called an organism. That's what an organism is. It's a combination of life forms, right? I mean, you're, you're made up of millions and millions of cells. Each one of those is an individual life form. Together, they form the human body, which is an organism. But spiritually, you're the same thing. But instead of it being cells, it's, a, it's archetypes. And each of these archetypes is represented in different capacities. So like I said, there's millions of them more than we can count. But what we can do is we can find the archetypal family that these clumps of, of energy systems belong to. And then we can identify what the primary ratios are. And that gives us enough insight in order to work with it on some level. And that's what this is going to do. So I would have loved to have Nick Bancock on, um, uh, Bantock rather, I'm sorry, Nick Bantock on to talk about this, but he didn't want to come on. Um, but he did say, feel free to use the deck any way you see fit. And that's what we're doing tonight. So I, um, if for those of you who have studied tarot, you know that there are different spreads you can use. And there's different spreads in the book, but I didn't find that the ones in the book were ones that I wanted to work with. What I found instead was I wanted to create one that would be meaningful to this purpose of identifying the archetypes that make up our reality, understanding them, and then being able to work with what those core things are. So I want you tonight to write down, if you get a reading, if you're lucky enough to get a reading, um, write down what they are. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to draw four cards for um, each person. Okay. That um, we read. And like I said, I'm not going to be able to do everybody. I don't know how many people are going to call in when we do it. Um, and I don't want to rush these. They are more involved. So it's more about uh, setting an experience here than it is about, you know, getting readings out. But uh, in, uh, anal uh, in, in psychoanalysm, you know, Freudian psychology and Jungian psychology, there was an understanding under Freud 
that our reality of consciousness is made up of, of um, three primary aspects, the id, the ego, and the superego. And I would say that in metaphysics, they've added one more, which is, I think, very important, and that is the superconsciousness. So we're going to draw a card for each one of these, one for the id, one for the ego, one for the superego, one for the superconscious, okay? And I'm going to explain to you what these are. I have my notes here. I've got all my notes. I've been working with this deck all week to get prepared for doing this today um, because I am new to this deck, but I'm not new to the archetypes they represent. But every model has their own approach to it. So sometimes it is kind of like seeing a new face to an old friend. You're going to find if you were a student of mine and we studied tarot, and I've been you know, studying and teaching tarot for 30 years now, um, you're going to find that some of these archetypes are three or four of the major arcana cards broken up into four variations of the same one. You're going to find that tonight because the major arcana cards are so complex that in order to break them down to the human level, they need to be sometimes more than just one thing. Okay, and we're going to, look at some of those tonight. So the ego, the first card I'm going to draw is called the ego. And that is going to be the conventional known identity. What, who we are to ourselves. Okay. So that's who the, the ego is. In fact, this is an interesting lead in because next week on vestiges, we're going to have um, returning guest Michael Van Oen, a good old friend of mine, to talk about the ego reality. She's also been a student of mine, a student for many, many years, even more years than, than even uh, Forbidden Truth. I've known her since she was a child. And um, she's going to talk about ego reality uh, next week, which is kind of what this one is. Okay, so this is who you think you are to yourself. Okay, so this would be the one that's the most familiar to you. Now, you might say, what if the 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 archetype that comes up for my ego is unfamiliar well that's a problem isn't it because <laughs> that could indicate that who you think you are is not really who you've been and maybe you're not as aware as you think you are so i'm going to be completely honest i the reason i'm reading jamie and brandon first is because um some of you, after you see how this works, might be uncomfortable getting a reading because I'm not going to lie about anything, okay? If I see something in these archetypes, I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm not going to hold back because I don't do that, okay? So there might be things that are revealed about you that you might not even want to know about yourself. That's kind of how this works. And you might say, well, how does it work, Bishop? How, does, how can shuffling a deck of cards tell us anything? Well, it's because of the laws of synchronicity, okay? As soon as we put intention out into something, it becomes a reflection of that very thing. Um, but we have to be careful because we can also put our intention into the result, and we don't want that. So I'm going to teach you how to actually condition your mind so that it's the most open and we can get the most accurate response. I can't guarantee you always 100% accuracy. There's no such thing. But I can get us pretty close to at least 90% accuracy based upon letting go of certain types of uh, inhibitors that come up. We'll get to that when we get to them. You'll see when I, when I read Jamie here. All right, so the first card is going to be the ego. All right, the second card is going to be the super ego. So for those of you who studied Freud, you already know what this one is. This is going to be the conventional identity that is forced upon us by other people, usually our parents. This is who we are to others. So the Ego is who you really are inside, and that might be something you hide to a lot of people because you're not happy with who you are. But the superego is typically who you project to everyone else. So our morality typically is from the superego because our egos are usually immoral, or at the very, le at the very least, they're amoral. Um, very rarely do we have moral egos. Morality is something that has to be conditioned upon us because we're so unruly, uncivilized animals. Um, the superego is how that's done. It's usually through parental guidance, okay? Or a, your, your pastor could infuse a superego into you. So if the ego is who we are to ourselves, the superego is who we are to others, and there's an archetype that will govern each one of these parts of our self, self in quotation marks, okay? The third one is the id, and the id is, is, is where things get a little crazy. 
Okay, so that is the base primal unconscious identity. This is who we are in nature. And this is almost entirely unknown to us. In fact, we might, this one might be one that you will hear and flat out disagree with. And it is only by coming to accept whatever that information is that you can then start to elicit change. Because typically, if your life sucks, it's because of the id. It is because of that, the archetypes that are lying in the unconscious realm of our reality. Okay. The last card is going to be the superconscious, and that is our spiritual identity. That is who we are becoming. So here's the real power of this exercise. Once we've identified our core being and the games we play with ourselves and others through the id, the ego, and the superego, the superconscious can show us who we are becoming in this current state. And if we don't like that, that's the one we can easily change because that's the one that's not entirely written yet. The spiritual life is uh, fluid. It's, it's malleable. And salvation is about preserving that one. But you don't want to preserve one that sucks. <laughs> and so we're going to know whether or not it sucks by taking a look at this. So you scared? Me. <laughs> Just my, my cheeks are rosy from the cookies. <laughs> <not from> the... <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave you the book. Okay. So when I, when I, when I reference a card, there's a little description there. I'd like you to read that description. Okay. I turn right to midwife. See that? <laughs> um, and, uh, okay. And then I'm going to, the, the index is in the beginning. So, gotcha. yeah. So what you'll do is you'll go to the beginning and you'll find the, um, the card that we reference. This deck also comes with two blank cards. So if there's an archetype that's missing, and I'm going to tell you right now, there's only 40 cards in this deck, I think, 40. I think it's 40 uh, card, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, one of the archetypes is the wolf. Um, but... Um, there's only thir there's only um, 40 cards. So obviously it's not going to contain every potential archetype. Every archetype is always an infusion of different ones, okay? Um, but you can create your own if there's one that you absolutely need that the deck does not contain. And I have not done that here because I'm actually in the process with my students creating our own archetypal deck. And we're almost done with it, honestly. So we'll make that available to those of you who might want to purchase that deck when it is finished. Um, but anyway, so we always start any kind of divination session. And this is a different type of divination. This is not divination in the, in the um, again, in the psychic sense. This is divination in the internal sense where using synchronicity to reveal certain aspects about our nature that are currently typically hidden to us. And some of it might be, it should be, at least the, uh, the ego and superego should be familiar. Okay. We'll talk about it if it's not familiar. You tell me. All right. But um, we always want to clear a deck uh, of any potential energy from any previous reading. And I already gave myself a reading to see how it works. And it was dead on accurate. Okay. Um, and if we have time, I'll even share with you what they were uh, once we've had a chance to kind of play with these a little bit. But I'm shuffling it right now for those of you who are not on YouTube and listening on Spreaker with the audio only, um, or if you're going to listen to this in an on-demand podcast later on, um, you might hear the deck in the background here. And I'm, I, if there's long periods of silence, it's just because there's a little bit of meditation going on. <laughs> it's not kind of hard to be host and engineer and, and, and guest at the same time, but we'll, we'll make this work. Okay. So here we go. And so it's almost ready here. I look for, I I've gotten to a point where I can kind of feel when the energy has been cleared. Um, certain sensitivities come with the work that I do. So that's one of them. All right. Well, either the air came on, or I just had a rush of energy get through my back. Did you? Like, for real, yeah. Yeah, no, the air, the, the, there's no, the, the vent is down there, yeah. and it's not on because it's too cold outside. There's an energy flow going yeah, on. A little energy. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Now, for those of you out in the audience, um, 
we're going to, I'm going to do it for you. But because Jamie's here with me in studio, it's always a little bit better if they do it themselves. So um, I'm going to have you take the deck, just leave it in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. And here's what I'm going to want you to do. Now, this is going to be true for all of you. So when you get your reading, I want you to be already ready to do this. If you're planning on calling in, um, I want you to be prepared for this because this is how you prevent the number one problem people have when they do divination is that they find that the their readings only reflect their desires or their fears, but they're not reflecting reality. And typically that's what you're going to get out of an oracle is your fears or your or your wants. Even Ouija boards will typically tell you the things that you're most afraid of, the things that you're most desirous of, but neither one of them is actually true. And that's, oh, it's the demons lying to you. No, it's not demons lying to you. What it is, is your own uh, ego reality is constantly in the business of lying to everyone, including yourself. Okay. So you have to suspend that in order to get accurate results. And this is part, a big part of what I teach my students. And it's something that is an ongoing lifelong struggle for anybody that embarks upon this. Okay. So the first thing that you do when you're getting a reading, and this is true if you're going to go to a psychic fear, because they're not going to teach you what I'm about to teach you here. This is a necessary part of being able to be successful in any kind of divinatory sense. So what you want to do is you want to firmly in your mind, close your eyes if you want to, or keep them open. It doesn't matter as long as you're comfortable. And I want you to focus strongly on your question. But in this case, since we're not doing a divination session um, in the psychic sense, what I want you to do is focus on who you think you are. Yeah, I'm asking it to show me who I am. Yeah, to show you the truth of who you are, the truth, the authentic truth of who you are. And then I want you to hold that firmly in mind. That's your intent, okay? That's your intent. I want you to now pick up the deck holding that intent firmly in mind and start to shuffle it any way you want to, okay? Um, and just keep it going um, and hold that intention. And here in about a moment, just keep shuffling the card, holding that intention, holding that intention of who you think you are, being wanting this oracle to reveal to you the authentic person, okay? And then I want you to release it. I want you to take that intention and throw it away. Just cast it into some dark abyss in front of you and replace it with a bright light and let that light shine on you and focus only on the light, no longer thinking about the intention. And while you're thinking of that, I want you to recite the mantra. Um, it's a wonderful Buddhist mantra. Gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, buddhi, soha. Now, it, you know I've got memory problems. That's you okay. Me it's okay. That. As long as you're hearing it, it's fine. Yes, I'm hearing so, gati, gati, para gati, para sam gati, buddhi, soha. It means gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond the beyond. Hail the jewel in the lotus. It's um, kind of a way of, of uh, realizing the uh, anatta, the, the essential non-existence of the self. Um, so gati gati para gati para sam gati buddhi soha. Okay, continue. And then when it feels, and it should feel it, if you're doing this correctly and you're focusing on that white light and you've no longer, you're not thinking about your intention anymore. The intention's gone. All there is is the light. All there is is the mantra. And then it should feel done. And when it's done, just put it down in front of you. And that's all there is to it. So that's going to be true. So we're going to let Jamie continue to do that. And I'll continue to talk a little bit about this here while she continues to get to the point where it's done. And uh, this is going to be the same true for all of you. Only the difference is I'm going to have to feel it for you because you're not here to shuffle the deck yourself. But um, I'm pretty good at doing this by now. So don't worry about it. Okay. So Jamie, just put it down. Now, Jamie, with your left hand, without any thought at all, just with your left hand, just cut the deck and cut it to the left. And then cut that deck to the left. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to lay out the first card, the second card, the third card, and the fourth card. Okay. I'm going to put these over here so that um, they're out of the way. All right. So are we ready to see the essential reality? Rip the Band-Aid off, man. <laughs> here we go. 
Okay, I got my notes here um, because I, I went through each one of these cards over the week to get very familiar with them and to write down some key points. They're basically just keywords that I found important to understanding these particular archetypes because every deck has their own. Tarot has their own, that type of thing. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is the ego, okay? And the ego card here is the healer. And we knew this one. So read, read your, the description of the healer. Stand by. Basically, the healer is someone who must learn to heal or suffer the consequences of not doing so. That's the core of this particular archetype. In other words, this is a person who has had to experience being broken <laughs> and in order to be able to move on, she has had to learn how to heal her reality or basically suffer and, and die, which is kind of the story of your, your life right now. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Do you want me to read? The Go ahead. You can read. Just read. Maybe read the first paragraph. Attribute. Yeah. The healer oversees your physical and mental well-being. She knows what you need and what you do not. To lose touch with her voice is to lose your health. Being able to call on her nurturing support is fundamental to your survival. She is always close by, but if you are unwell and continue to ignore her wise promptings, your pain will be exasperated. Can <laughs> we do persona? Um, you know, you know, maybe the first part of it, just so that okay. we can get it. We don't have to do this for every single card, right. but it gives stepping, people an idea how Stepping through the ring of healing flame, she will enfold you in her arms to cauterize your wounds. The celestial parvati is skilled in all of the arts of curing malaise and... It's a little dark in here, I know. Yeah. Sorry. As, uh, asiwaging, uh, pain. Let's just say pain. Go to her. She will relieve you from your hurt. So this is the Cut. card. This is, this is uh, the card of the healer, just for those of you who want to see um, what we drew here for, the, for her ego. Not surprising to me, knowing no. Jamie Wolf and who she is today now if she would have pulled this before her accident probably would have been a very different archetype but because that was a trauma and trauma can change your aggregate structure it did sometimes for the worse sometimes for the better okay let me go back to the normal well actually i'm going to leave it on this i'm going to leave it on this camera for a bit so we can continue to okay. um I can show the cards to the new people. So let's look at the super ego. Now, this is who you are to other people. This is who you have been forced to become from other people. And this is so, so revealing. <laughs> the, <laughs> the arbiter, of course. The arbiter? Just, basically, it is, it is a, a person of justice who, who imparts justice, who, uh, who governs justice. Is it any surprise that you were a law officer? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, let's face it. Yeah, law enforcement and military. Yep. yep. And military too. So um, the arbiter is justice, causation, and consequence. It is somebody who basically dishes out these things. Okay. It's not just about, I mean, it's, it is very much fundamentally about law and order. And it's who you had to become. So isn't it interesting that internally you're more of the doctor, but externally you're more of the, the police officer but who are you more today? It's it's this because what are you doing in this ministry? You're you're, you're trying to heal. You're healing people, but also still and kick, healing yourself. Also, still try to kick evil. So well, you got to do that too, yeah. and that's what this comes in as well. <laughs> um, so go ahead, read a few uh, lines from this one. Attribute: The arbiter is even-handed when we accept her help. We accept the concept of fairness and good sense. She is the opposite of impulsive, and her weighing of any situation makes us better able to decide between short and long-term gain. In trusting her measured approach, we find it easier to separate our wants from our needs and our cravings from our necessities. And that's very much a true, I mean, again, um, the book is very ethereal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, I think Nick's intention, and I got a little bit from this just from the short interaction I had with him. Um, he really did not want to do to imprint too much of himself into this deck. I think he really wants this to be something that you imprint yourself into. So he just gives prompts to get you 
uh, get your imagination flowing, but you really need to find the meanings of yourself. And this is very clearly, to me, a reflection of the archetype of justice in the tarot, the major arcana, right. um, which is a uh, basically a cause and effect type of archetype. It produces the... Um, the causes and effects of, of our actions. And you're all about personal responsibility. This card's all oh, about I'm, personal responsibility. Yes, I'm libertarian to the core. Yep. Well, maybe not to the core. You're a healer at the core. But this is this is who you are, at least in terms of how you have to deal with other people. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So now let's get to the, the dirty part. Okay. Right. This Primal. Is, this is where the dirty laundry is. Okay. <laughs> So this is this there's is, always dirty laundry. There's always dirty laundry. <laughs> All right, let's see what. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! This is very interesting. And I'm it's, out. <laughs> it's very very true. It's very very true because I mean I'm so out. <laughs> this is the innocent. Oh. Okay. Um, it is a youthful, vibrant energy. It's trusting and it is full of positivity. This is your core nature. You're actually a far more, a, I should say, let, let me put it this way. You're a far less worldly person than you've been forced to be because of your career paths and the work that you do. Right. But you might have detached yourself a bit from this one because you've had to. I've had to, yeah. I mean, you, you can only stay innocent so long when you're constantly thrown into a world of evil and chaos. And so let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you a very difficult question because people that have this archetype typically are people that have had, have had people take advantage of them several times and you've had to be put up this one in order to protect yourself from ever having it happen again. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So your times. childhood, you probably suffered that a few times. My childhood wasn't bad, but yeah, there was, there was in that. your youth. I meant to say in my yeah. youth. Yeah. yeah. And then in, in past relationships. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So you're not as trusting as you used to be no. because of that. Betrayal, dishonesty. Mm -hmm. We'll do that to you. You put up a wall. But what a wonderful id yeah. to have. I mean, to be, I mean, this is like the purest id I'm there is. I'm still a little kid on the inside. <laughs> well, you definitely I'm are. just rough around the edges. <laughs> <laughs> that's very very true uh, probably not what you would have thought though no i did not think that. you probably would have thought uh, that more of an aggressive like maybe the wolf right um, well that's but, my animal archetype that's a different yeah kind of thing, a different thing yeah. yeah yeah do you want me to yeah read go ahead read read, okay. read a few parts of it just this, uh, i know it's kind of hard you have a light on your phone well you got the thing that's on okay. there okay uh the innocent guilelessly sticks his nose into every corner and crevice crevice to see what he will find in his idealism, he believes himself. You are an to be, idealist to, too. You really I try are. to be to be immune to danger. <laughs> uh, I'm not immune to danger, but I have been. I feel like I've been protected in some app in some instances. Well, that's his that's energy is infectious. We need the sap of youth running through our veins to invigorate us. It draws us from. It draws us from, tuper and lethargy, lethargy, and drives us to take on the trials and tribulations. That would otherwise daunt us. The sky grows blue, and we become immortal again for a day, at least. For those of you who are familiar with the tarot, this is basically an extension of the major arcana card, the sun. Okay, so there's a lot of innocence and positivity associated with this. The fact that she has that as an id is an amazing thing, because usually our ids are where the dirty aspects of ourselves reside. That's the repressed part of us. She's repressed it because of, I guess, self-preservation and the fact that she took on careers where you can't be this trusting no. as a police You'll officer. You'll get killed. You'll get killed, yeah. Um, but it doesn't change your nature. It just means that you've put up these things in order to protect you. But so you, you, want, you want to think the best in everybody, but you know, the older you get, the more you realize everybody's corrupted in some way. Exactly. And see, right. what's interesting here between these two, these two is that the healer is kind of the bridge mm -hmm. because a healer is, is, you know, has a understanding of justice and worldliness in order to effectuate, you know, justice, but it also preserves the innocence because a healer is ultimately a preserver. Well, it's interesting because my law enforcement and military career are now over. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to heal myself from what I had to deal with in that career mm -hmm. And at the same time, try to heal other people by using my experiences to help them get through what they're going through with their traumas. Yeah, 
Yeah. So I do see that segue. Yeah. And you can yeah. see that. It's all it's all flowing. Now, right. this one's going to be the interesting one because this one is Look, You who, said that about the last one. Well, because <laughs> this because this is like the dirty laundry. Oh. But we're not we're not looking at the dirty laundry right now. What we're looking okay, at right now is this is who you are in the process of becoming. Oh. Okay. Um and this is very interesting. Um also very true, I think. Very true. It's the observer. Hmm. Okay. The observer, my notes on this one, is one who watch, uh, one who watches with extreme attention to detail. <laughs> so it, you have now reached a point where you're more interested in being on the sidelines observing than you are being a full participant in anything. Um, and... That is what's leading you to becoming one of uh, of an uh, objective spiritual advancement. So I'd say that an observer is a wonderful one to have in that position because ultimately the highest reality of a spiritual uh, or spiritually evolved being would be to observe, to not longer, to no longer have to participate because what you are essentially is awareness itself. So go ahead and read some of the descriptions from the book just so we can have a more fused idea. The observer attendant attentively examines the smallest details of those around and through quiet diagnostic watchfulness is able to understand their behavior, their motives, and their agendas. Follow his eyes and you will see who is good-hearted and who cannot be trusted. Holy crap. L listen to his <laughs> observations. And learn the art of reading the human condition. See. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing now. It's what I did in law enforcement. For I look for certain things. Yeah. But now that I'm retired and I'm trying to find my spiritual path, mm -hmm. this is what I do with people of other religions, other faiths, other political. I try to see their side of it. And I will sit back and listen. And then I'll be able to discern, you know, what's the bullshit from the reality that they're giving me. Do you notice how none of this is your desire? No, no. All they, of this is no, just... They, they flat out called me out. Well, yeah, because see, if it would have been your desire, I think you would have seen the warrior here. You would have seen the wolf. You would have seen things that would have been aspects or attributes that you are that you cultivate. That would have been cool, but that's kind of a different thing. Because so. that's not necessarily the aggregate structure that you contain. Right. These are things that you do with your aggregate structure, mm -hmm. but they're not the core realities. These are the core realities, and none. Of, we have no control over these. No. The ego is just what it is. The super ego is what was given to you. The id is is your nature. So there's nothing you can do to change that one. And um, and who you become spiritually is, is, is a combination of all of this. Mm -hmm. Again, it's largely outside of your control, but that is the one that you can change. But I wouldn't change that. No. I think you should continue to cultivate the observer. I agree. But, yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Well, there you go. Okay, so um, Brandon. Ooh, are Brandon, you ready? Are you, you ready to do? Do you still want to do it? I don't want to force you. <laughs> I, I've been waiting since last week. Okay, so let's get you started here as our second example. We'll definitely have time for some, you know, one or two, maybe two or three from the audience. We still tonight. got an hour, guys. We do. We have an hour. So I'm going to clear the deck here, and we probably won't be able to read all of it this segment. But when we come back from the break at the top of the hour, we will finish Brandon's and then start doing some of yours in the audience. So. Let me go ahead and just clear this one. Um, all right, I'm going to switch to the other camera real quick just so that we can. There we go. All right, Brandon. Um, we're pretty much there. Hang on a second. It's pretty clear. Okay. All right, Brandon, same as before, only I'm going to be shuffling for you, but I want you to hold in your mind right now this, the, the absolute intention of having this deck of cards reveal to you through the laws of synchronicity a um, perfect representation of who you are in truth, your most accurate self or at least who you think yourself might be. Hold that intention and continue to hold it as the only thing in your mind. Do not become distracted by anything else. If you do become distracted by something else, just simply dismiss the distraction and return to the intention. Okay? Focus. 
Keep focused on it. Okay. We're almost there, Brandon. Just keep focused. All right. So now what I want you to do, okay, is replace your intention by casting it out into a dark abyss and have the dark abyss in front of you that you threw your intention out to be replaced with a bright light and just focus on that light. Let it shine and bask in the radiance of that light and forget completely about the intention. Intention's gone. Intention doesn't matter. Just focus on the light. The light's the only thing that matters now. Feel its warmth, feel its brightness, but there's nothing else to focus on. And then repeat the, the mantra, gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, buri, soha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, buri, soha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, buri, soha. Gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond the beyond. Hail the Buddha and the Lotus. Okay. Okay, we're almost there. Just keep basking in that light. Okay. All right. Okay, Brandon, you can come back to normalcy. Okay. Do you want me to read the descriptions for him? Um, it, just the first paragraph. Yeah, if if um if you want to. Oh, my eyes are burning now. See, sometimes when I do, I had another surge of energy come yeah. through. It is. About it is. Through. It is definitely. It's there's right energy. I mean, yeah, it's. I find this a lot when I do this kind of work. Um, it's always your eyes that get affected. When my eyes spirit are spirit comes in. Typically, yeah, yeah. Typically, it is. Okay, let's start with the first one here. We can probably do the ego, and then we'll have to break. So let's see which one it is. Oh, you get the eccentric. Mm. All right. So the eccentric, um, my notes on that one are, this is sort of a deviation of the hangman in the tarot. It is a, is a person with strong individualist uh, and non-conformist conformist, um, tendencies. Um, not giving a damn what anyone else thinks. You're going to do your own thing. Um, I don't like it. Yep. It's a wonderful thing to be. And I think that definitely represents you because look at you. You come from this, uh, this world of very conventional religion and you're willing to challenge those assumptions, those paradigms in order to do what you feel is the right thing to do. Right. Um, so go ahead and read the, the eccentric and sure. let me show you guys. Let me go ahead and switch the camera back so you can see um, what the card is. The eccentric reminds you that you have every right to be whomever you choose, from silent introvert to Gregorious extrovert. He will give you the courage to follow your whims, quirks, and curiosities, and free you from the constraints of societal demands and expectations. In the words often attributed to Oscar Wilde, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. <laughs> I love that. Be yourself, Oscar everyone Wilde, else is already taken. Oscar Wilde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Essentially, the reason that this is linked to the hangman archetype is because, see, the hangman is a very complex archetype. It's obviously about sacrifice, but it's also more than, than, it's also about being able to see things in different perspectives, being able to see the world in a different way. He hangs upside down, so he sees what no one else can see um, because his perspective has been shifted. And sometimes he offers himself as a sacrifice in order to shift perspective. And we see that even in the fundamental um, archetype of the hangman in the realm of religion with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is what does Jesus do by hanging on the cross? Jesus changes fundamentally our perspective. He shifts our uh, relationship to God through that experience. So it's all the same hangman energy and a very individualistic, very nonconformist. Jesus was very individualistic, very nonconformist in the sense of, of his approach. Um, and, uh, I think that definitely applies to you and your ego. This is who you are to yourself. So would you agree with that, Brandon? At first I kind of really did it, but then when you started explaining it more and more, mm. then I would say that's pretty spot on. <laughs> yeah. It's not eccentric in the sense that, you know, you're into lavish lifestyles or something like that. Although that could be part of it. It's eccentric in the sense that when you're willing to, 
go beyond the conventional acceptable method, that becomes a type of eccentrism in the sense that you're unlocking potentials there. So when we come back, we're going to break right here. When we come back, we will continue on with Brandon's reading and then we'll do some of yours. Okay. Don't go away.
Welcome back, everyone, to the third and final part of Vestiges After Dark. Tonight, we are looking at your archetypes, and we'll be taking your calls here in a moment to see if we can get through some of these readings with all of you who are interested. And we already see some people on the line. The number to call is 378-362-6380. That's three. I'm sorry. Sorry. 718 718 718-362-6380. That's 718-362-6380. Enter pin number 855-4111. 855-4111 to get into the queue. I hate when they change up my phone number. It always messes up my head. Oh, I, um, I know. Uh, so 718-362-6380. Okay. Um, and we'll take you on. We can also take your questions from the chat room if there's time. We'll be finishing up Brandon's reading here when we ret- when we return in just a moment. Don't go away. Okay, so let's continue on. I see there's a lot of people in the queue, okay? More than we've ever had, which is awesome. You guys, you know, thank you for participating in this. We'll try to get through everybody, um, even if I have to go a little quicker. Um, but we'll do our best, okay? I can't promise anything. 
but we'll order. We'll I'll answer them in the order that they came in. Okay, so the next one we're going to do. Wait a second. What are we up to here? We're, we're going to. Okay, so we're going to do now the super ego. Super ego. Super ego. Okay. So super ego. This is who you were forced to become. Okay. Um, and this is typically the result, Brandon, of um, parental influence, but also the influence of people. So it's the dreamer. Okay. Um, and this is mostly linked to the um, tarot card of the star. It is what produces hope and regeneration. Oh, I got to change the camera here for you guys on YouTube. I had to do that here. Okay, here we go. So what we're seeing here is a thirst for idealism, a thirst to be as perfect as one can become. But it's also, again, just the word dream, dreamy. It, it is a, there's a lack of fundamental reality to this one. Okay, so I think a lot of your eccentric ego is a counter to this super ego, which kind of, un, I think, rendered you somewhat unprepared, Brennan, for the world that is because this was perhaps more of an idealism of childhood and trying to preserve innocence when it's not necessarily the best course for preparing the real challenges of the world. And so this leaves with a bit of a unrealistic expectation um, that can lead to disappointment if those hopes are not accomplished. On the other side, though, it can give you a strong inspirational shift to be able to produce um, a wonderful life, but you have to work really hard to be able to make this a reality because there's, there's just so much fiction in this one. So, um, Jamie, go ahead and read what the author says about it. Okay. I'll read this one. Then I'll probably just let you do your thing yeah, so go we ahead. can save time. Yeah. Uh, the dreamer brings renewed hope and the dreamy weaves will act as a source of regeneration. He helps you translate your abstract thoughts from image to language and back again. He reminds you that life has alternating phases and that the sun and moon take turns in lighting the way. By day, you strive with practical purpose, but at night, you live through the lens of an intuitive kaleidoscope. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like me. He's like, dang. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, 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 I think that says it all. And for those of you, for those of you in the queue, don't hang up. Okay. You'll lose your place. So stay on the line. Don't hang up your phone. I'm going to try my best to get to all of you. Okay. All right. So let's now look now at the id. Now, like I said, this is the dirty laundry section. You you had none. You had the cleanest dirty laundry I've ever seen. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, basically, it is, you had the card of your shit does not stink in the id position. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. My my shit still stinks. Well, your your yeah. ego and super ego, but not your id. <laughs> I Let's guess I'll Brandon. take the win. Let's see what Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Uh oh. The Sage. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Heck yeah, dude. That's another good id. And let's let me read to you this one, okay? So here are my notes. Expresses profound levels of wisdom, is reliable, rational, um, and um, expresses useful wisdom to themselves and others. So wisdom is the core of your being, your unconscious reality, your unconscious thirst um, is all about the attainment of wisdom and the acquiring of new levels of understanding. Um, it's a good thing to have in the id position because uh, this is all unconscious. So if you're wondering why you went from this eccentric nonconformist, you know, as a reaction to this dreaminess, this is putting that dreaminess into practicality so your dreams are something that can be manifest um brandon it's not just uh, oh what happened here <laughs> what happened <laughs> jamie just lost her um it her uh, back of my head oh goodness jamie just lost her headset um but anyway um that's what this one means so i would say that is a fantastic uh id card what, what are your thoughts there uh, i I had done a past life reading like maybe last year or so, uh -huh. and the person told me that in a past life I was a scribe. Well, there you go. Wisdom is at the core of it all. So I'm just going to press ahead here while Jamie tries to get herself back together. <laughs> um, and let's look at your spiritual nature. This is your super consciousness. And 
How very fascinating. I just want to mention this, okay, because this is the first time I've seen one that is one of my own. I had this card in my spread, but this was my id. So this is your super conscious. This is who you're in the process of becoming. It is the warrior. Okay, the warrior. And that is a fearless defender who is unintimidated and fierce. Okay, that's my id. It absolutely it represents me because that's where the exorcist comes from. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also my crass nature. But I, I think this also is, as far as the spiritual, this is where your, your spiritual power comes from. And it is your focus. So what a wonderful reading. Honestly, Brandon, you, this is... A fantastic. Want to give a few words from that one? Sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. The warriors are fearless defender and champion who will protect you against the who will protect you against those wishing you malice. Let him be your courage, your right arm, and he will not let you down. When he stands before you, you can be confident that no one be will be able to bully or intimidate you. He has the strength of a polar bear, the speed of a cheetah, and the reflexes of a cobra. His flesh is impenetrable. And his blade is razor sharp. I would say that that was a fantastic reading. I mean, again, you have a very pure aggregate structure. Um, your weakness is, in, in a very similar way, the same weakness that Jamie has in the sense that Jamie's weakness is, of course, was being more about she has a too trusting nature that she's had to learn to temper a bit. Yours is perhaps the dreaminess. It is, it is getting a little too lost in, in, um, in pie in the sky ideas and trying to bring them down to tangible reality. But with that warrior in your super conscious position, you are somebody who can actually make those things happen. So I would say to both of you, he's a diamond in the rough. Well, both of you, I would say you don't need to change a thing. Just keep, keep on developing. Keep, keep on doing what I'm doing. Do what you're doing. You're on the right course. Um, and that's what you want to see. You want to see a, a, a rating like that. Okay, so I'm clearing the deck right now, getting ready for our first caller. Let me just go ahead and make sure we get all that old energy out and see, look, they're flying out of my hands. That's. <laughs> I think what's interesting to me yeah. about the Warrior card is with me investigating... Uh, I've found that people are looking to me during the investigations to try to keep them safe. Yeah, because you're the level-headed. So, you're the you're the one that's got your shit together. Um, so people look to you, and that that you can't hide that. That comes off of you. So uh, yeah, remember this is all stuff that you can't. You did not choose these. The, these aggregates are chosen for you. This is what you have to work with in your life, and you just both have good things to work with. Some people are not as lucky, um, but you are. And the only one you can really change is your super conscious one, but um, I would not change either of yours. They're both good ones, okay? Both useful. Good is kind of a relative thing, but for the purposes of what we're talking about here in a casual sense, they're good. All right, let's go ahead and bring on our first caller, getting really excited about this. Um, actually, hang on a second. Oh, whoop, I pushed the wrong button. Hang on a second here. I pushed the wrong one. Here we go. All right, 360. Um, Washington, hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. I'm Natasha. Na oh, Natasha. <laughs> Natasha got Our guest I was from last week. With you last week. <laughs> Let me correct a wrong because this has bugged me ever since. I pronounced Natasha's name wrong uh, last week. Her name is uh, v uh, Venter, not Ventner. I said Ventner because I knew a Ventner and I couldn't get it out of my head. So it's Venter, Natasha Venter. So, um, you are so funny. <laughs> So everybody but, trying to look her up and couldn't find her, there you go. But we're going to have her on. We're going to have uh, <laughs> Natasha on later in this season to talk about Feng Shui, and that is already scheduled. So yeah, make sure you cool. look at the schedule ahead. She's going to be on. But tonight, let's go ahead and take a look at your aggregates, Natasha. How about that? Well, that sounds good. And, and believe me, I hold no judgment. And so it's like, it's whatever works. When okay. somebody looks up our name, I say, Put it in the bees, look in the bees, look in the V's, look wherever you need to look. <laughs> I think I played too much Monopoly growing up. I, I, I always liked Ventnor Avenue. So. <laughs> I apologize. But um, no, somebody, I think it was one of your, Don't worry about it. One of your fans or, or, or somebody had come on 
and talked about how they've been following, you know, your you work for years. Bishop. And she said, um, just to, just to make sure you know that her, her name is Ventner, not Ventner. And I'm like, did I say Ventner? Did. Cause I didn't remember saying it. I went back and I played it in a shirt. Did I? No, you did it. You did it. No. Natasha, he was so horrified. He had to go back and listen to the replay. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. You know, I, you know, it's, it's in my aggregates. I'll, if we have time, I'll talk about them. Okay. Uh, Natasha, same as we did with the others, just go ahead and hold firmly in your mind that intention i know that you've been doing this kind of work all your life so it should be very easy for you to do i don't really have to teach you so go ahead and just hold that intention and then um, keep it there until we're just about there just keep that intention that you want to see the most accurate representation of your aggregate structure and then we're going to release it now so go ahead and release it to the white light let that white light take over completely abandon send it out into the abyss the intention no longer matters now it's just a clear white light and just keep that clarity there and we're just going to go a little bit further with the shuffle here just keep that clear light in your presence and remember the mantra gate gate para gate para sam gate buddhi soha gate gate para gate para sam gate buddhi soha Okay, almost there. Here we go. Here we go. See, I can feel it when it's done. It's done. All right, we're going to shuffle. I got to step away because I got to use my left hand for this. Okay, there we go. Kind of hard to do when I'm trying to talk on the microphone. All right, Natasha, you can come back to normal consciousness if there is such a thing. And um, let me go ahead and. <laughs> not, for <me. laughs> not, not for you right <laughs> okay let's see what we got here so your your oh this is good okay so here's your ego uh it is the illuminator and guess what you and i share the same e- uh, ego card that's mm-hmm. mine too the illuminator and that's not surprising at all considering who you are and what you do so the her- the illuminator is corresponding in the major arcana card in the tarot to the hermit It is the one that is connected to fundamental awareness with a strong sense of meaning, looking for meaning and helping others to find meaning. It's the focus of your natural self. So this is who you are to yourself and what you spend your time doing, which is clearly this, because, I mean, you are absolutely illuminating. Do you want to read a little bit about that? The illuminator holds a candle aloft against blackness. His flame cuts through the inky shade and shows us the terrain beneath our feet. This is the light of consciousness that gives all our senses meaning. He is also the means by which your inner eye can navigate through your maze of complex emotions and scattered thoughts. He is, in short, the one who makes you aware of your existence. So, um, again, illuminators in the ego position, um, they are people that are very much concerned about waking the world up. Okay. However, I would say she fits that. Yeah, I think she does. (laughs) And I do, too. So be it. Yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. That's a good ego to have. If that's going to be your ego, that's the one you want to have. That's my job. The light in the dark. (laughs) The light in the dark, right. All right, so let's look at your super ego. So this is the one you were forced to become because of other people and who you are to other people or how other people see you. It's the wanderer. Hmm. Okay, the wanderer. Um, And that is my notes. Let me get my notes here on this one. So this is the closest one to this in the major arcana is the chariot. This is very charismatic energy, fearless, heroic instincts that create an unwillingness to settle. In other words, you're always, um, you're always on the move and you're always uh, seeking new avenues of experience. It's somebody that is very much, I don't know if you travel a lot or if you've moved a lot in your life, but this is the, that tends to be what people under this influence do. And um, maybe you did a lot when you were a child because it, it does tend to be the one that you're kind of forced to deal with as you're going up and it's not a really bad one um but it is it is definitely one that uh has that kind of movement energy to it so uh, do you want to add anything uh jamie from the book uh the wander insists that you stop what you are doing clear your head breathe cool air into your lungs and feel the mossy rocks beneath your leather boots um and so yeah so it, think of the chariot and the in the major arcana mm-hmm. Um, It is a, it is a card of energy of movement of not necessarily transition, but it's, it's, it's a lot of 
it's a it's a high energy a card, and I see that in you. I you know you're 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 a high energy person, oh, yeah. Natasha. So I mean, you think you have to be because very high vibrationally. You, you know, you got to you got to deal with all those vibrations, so you have to channel it somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, because I I didn't move a lot. I didn't move a lot when I was a kid. I didn't travel a lot. I do have the call to travel. Okay, um, but if you consider traveling through dimensions and worlds, I would say that that's my kind of travel. So there we go. And I think that it, I mean, that does count because it is a manifestation of your, your experiential reality. And so sometimes, most mm-hmm. of the time it's going to be in a more material sense of actual moving around. But um, for somebody that has the kinds of abilities that you have, that might be how it ends up manifesting. It might be why it's so easy for you to do what you do. Um, because that's the, yeah. because this aggregate controls the internal experience as well as the external one. So astral travel would be something that comes very naturally to you because of that. So that makes sense. All right. Yes. My tether to this world, to my body is quite long, so I can go quite far. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. All right. The id, here's the dirty laundry card. Let's see how you do. Um, the strategist is your id. Mm. This is very interesting. Okay. Now remember, this is unconscious. Okay. This is, most people do not, you know, have to come to terms with this one. They sometimes will struggle with their id card. Um, the strategist, uh, uses logic and, um, cold calculating logic, um, with occasional informational overload that can lead to clear intelligent realizations. So at the core there is this um, aspect to you um, that, and maybe this is honestly, Natasha, how you're able to transcribe your uh, metaphysical experiences into something that is um, explainable and relatable to people because sometimes they can be so ethereal for people, they don't know how to conceptualize them. But I think you do a fairly good job of that and your nature is actually quite left brained and that I don't know, is this shocking to you or does this make sense to you? It makes total sense, you know, cause being dyslexic, I didn't really read. And so I don't have the book smart, but yeah. I have the world smart and there it and is. So, or world, worldly smarts. And so, you know, reality put me down in the 3d world for my language and yet gave me the, I was, you know, the quantum physics of the world, you yes. know, type of thing. So, yeah. It's been interesting to work in my knowing. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, um, you pretty much covered that. Yeah. Is that all? I mean, is there anything else in there to, <laughs> to add? That's pretty much it. In the um, book. He will help you resolve your complex problems as mind is a needle threading its way through the multitude of mathematical possibilities that lie before you. Well, there you go. And that's vibrational and Sounds geometric like as well. So right. even if you're not necessarily, you don't consider yourself to have a mathematical kind of mind, or maybe you are good at math, I don't know. We're all ones but, and zeros. But in the end, it's all it's also just about geometry. So metaphysics is really just basically vibrational geometry, um, which is another type of mathematics. And, and so, you know, mediums and people that are metaphysically connected in that way are going to operate on a sort of metaphysical level that is, or a mathematical level that is beyond numbers, but is also still math because it is geometric. So your last one here is the, is your super conscious. So this is who you are in the process of becoming. This is usually the one that really fascinates people the most. And again, no surprises here. It's the Mobius. Ooh. And the Mobius is the closest corol- corollary in the tarot is actually two. This rap- this is actually a combination archetype of two tarot cards, which is uh, the universe and the eon, or um, judgment is the other uh, name of it. Uh, the uh, in some decks, I use the ta- uh, the Crowley Toth deck. So the universe and the eon. This is a person who sees beyond time and mortality and uh, is reinvesting in oneself continuously. And you're also reinventing oneself continuously. So what you're really basically doing is you're always in the process of becoming. Um, See the Ouroboros there at the bottom. 
um, is very representative of that timelessness that uh, that you exist within. And again, I mean, this is no shock based no, upon all of the things that you've shared with us on the show and um, what you do with your life and how you help others with your special abilities. Um, it does not surprise me at all. So once again, a fantastic aggregate structure, not one that I think needs any modification. I think you're good to go, Natasha. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, this is totally me, and it, it explains a lot about me. And I appreciate the 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 vision of it. You know, the the knowing of it, and you know, it, it's one of those things that I really enjoy helping people bring what their knowings are down into this world of the three D. You know, walking through the mud that you know mm-hmm. so much we call it. Because I know I've reinvented myself so many times in this world. Just even in the last day or two, I've come to a great knowing. So it's. It's an interesting walk when you when you look at life with a, an open eyed perception. And and that's where that's like a perfect way of describing what that just was. You know, that is exactly, you know, your spiritual reality. That's your spiritual self. And it's profound. And I yeah. mean, honestly, that's one of the most profound ones you could get in that position. So what a marvelous reading. And thank, thank you. you so, thank you so much that's for calling in and participating in this. Good this to is talk great. To you again. Yeah, it's good to well, talk with you. Yeah. Yeah, can I add one more thing? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. I see Mother Mary, Jesus, and Michael standing behind you, holding their arms all kind of like linked into one another, just having big smiles on their faces for who you guys are. Well, you know, I love love me some Michael. I do. Well, that's fantastic. Because, you know, it's very interesting that the chapel is right behind this wall. That's true. So that doesn't, you know, that actually has some even tangible sense there. It's not just a vision that there's actually the chapel. The chapel's right there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's more about you guys than it is about the chapel because you hold the energy of the chapel. Well, that's great. Yeah, the chapel comes with us. That's true. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. Exactly. Exactly. But they're they're just so good. They hold hold so much gratitude for who you guys are breaking through these walls of what old you know the old thoughts are to create the new knowings for us who are walking into this world nowadays well, so they're just so grateful for you it's well, always good great. to know that's stay good. the course yeah thank you so much for that and we look so forward to your next appearance on the show i can't wait to talk with you again about feng shui and all that yeah well blessings to you and and have a good night you do thank you so much happy for calling moon. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. Thank you, Natasha. Oh, yes. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay, so now our next one here. I'm pretty sure this so cool. is uh, the next one on the list is, I believe this is Danielle. Danielle in the UK, you there? Did you get in, Danielle? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hello. Can you hear us? Uh, hello. All right. Hello. Can you hear us? Hello. I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Thought we had a problem there. Yeah, we thought we weren't sure. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's jump right in here. All right. So the cards are jumping all over the place. Okay. Okay, So Danielle, remember, focus very clearly on jumping because they're excited. They're very excited. They want to do this for you. So go ahead and (laughs) and and and, um, clear your mind and focus on who you see yourself to be, who you think you are, and making sure that. Um, you form a form a, a strong connection that these cards will reveal your authentic nature. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So we're. We're connecting here with Danielle, and she's holding that image in her mind. Her intention is to reveal her authentic self through the lens of this oracle. And now we're reaching that point where we're going to release it. So now go ahead, Danielle, release it into the abyss. It's gone. It's forgotten. There is no more intention. It's replaced now with that white light. Focus now on the white light, that radiance. Feel it. Bask in it. And hold just the white light. The old white light's the only thing that matters. The white light is the only thing that exists. You have a perfectly clear mind. There is no intention. And we now begin our mantra, Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Udi Soha. You're, you've been a student of mine since the very beginning, so you know the old routine. Hold that and keep that going. Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Udi Soha. Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Udi Soha. All right, 
think we're almost there. Keep it hold. Keep holding it. Just hold it. Holding that white light. Okay. Here we are. Here we are. Yep. Okay. Let me go ahead and lay the cards out. Trying to move as fast as I can to get to everybody on that list. We're working. <laughs> we're working at it. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right, Danielle, um, let's look at the ego here. Okay, so the ego, are you ready, Jamie? Yep. The ego is yeah. the sage. Well, that sounds familiar. Okay, so that, that is familiar, but it <laughs> obviously has a different manifestation mm -hmm. than it did before. Um, so this is because it's in the ego position. Again, this expresses profound levels of wisdom, reliable and rational, useful wisdom. Um, your ego reality is built upon this. So rather than it being an expression on some subconscious level, this is fully conscious for you. This is what matters to you. This is the only thing. Wisdom is the only thing that matters in this context. So, Sounds about right I mean, for Danielle. You're a student of mine, so yeah. clearly yeah. It's, it's, it's accurate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is all we do is spend time you know talking yeah. about wisdom so i expect my students to have at least this somewhere in their reading <laughs> okay <laughs> all right let's look at the super ego now the super ego this is who you've been forced to be because of other people and this is interesting because right. guess what you and i share this one i have this in my super ego position too okay and it is the oh. it's the survivor ah and I, I know, oh. I mean, I know enough <laughs> about you to know that this is accurate. Right. Okay. So the survivor doesn't really oh. have a major arcana correspondent. Um, it's kind of its own archetype in the sense, but the survivor is a pragmatic uh, or pragmatism rather implemented at all costs in order to survive at all costs. So this is a person who has had to struggle at the hands of other people and has had to come up with some pretty clever ways to be able to um, to get by and not be not succumb to those challenges. So you're a person who's been strengthened by this, but also had to suffer uh, a great deal to get there. Yeah, my God, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the super ego, you know, this is what how other people see you. Um, and a survivor is a good thing to be, um, but not at the expense of life. Remember my le my lesson from a few weeks ago: we don't want to get so lost in survival that we forget, forget to live. live. Yeah. Um, want to read from the book because we haven't really covered this archetype. Uh, the yet. survivor has been called many names, but at his core, he is proudly an independent forager. Some might try to label him a moral, but when the center fails to hold and things fall apart, leaving the landscape a wreck of hardship. Then the survivor's ethics become apparent. He functions in the gaps left by inequality and has no fear of draconian authority. Always the shrewd protagonist. Mm. Pra pragmatist, pragmatist, pragmatist. Pragmatist. Thank you. Yep. He makes certain that he and his companions will never starve. And see, that's, that is you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's easy when you're, when you're reading people, you know, you can see these kinds of things. It's, uh, you can see how these manifest because again, I'm not doing psychic readings here. I'm not trying to be like, let me wow you with my amazing powers to see into your, ear. it's not that what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the, how these archetypes manifest in your life, because these are the ones that are coming to the surface. These are the ones that want to be known. Okay. And these are the ones that you can once you understand and master these, then that's how you can take control of your reality. So these are the most important ones for doing that. So let's look at yeah. your dirty laundry. And uh, this is interesting. Let <laughs> me call the dirty laundry. The dirty, oh, laundry, dirty laundry. laundry. Yeah, this is dirty laundry. The id is always where all the dirt show, um, um, resides. Okay. And um, it's not a bad yeah. one. It's actually not a bad one. It's the inventor. Okay, so this is this is actually um, one manifestation. It's not all of it, but it's part of the manifestation of the magus. Um, it's also a little bit of the emperor as well in the major arcana, but it is the okay. quintessential Renaissance man. It's an inventor, an innovator, a fixer, a person who by nature wants to fix exactly why they are that way. But when this archetype is hidden deep inside your subconscious, this is what's happening there. So not a bad one to have in your subconscious. Interesting. Yeah, that's really intriguing. Yeah, you can make... Um, you can make things happen because, um, but the problem is it sometimes might be difficult for you to be able to translate that into tangibility so that you can utilize it and make it work. Um, but overall, 
um, you know, if you can tap into the subconscious reality, then you can actually make things happen. You can manifest reality for yourself. So, um, mm -hmm. kind of a fun, uh, yeah. kind of a nice thing to have so far. Survivor can be challenging. I have that one. I have that one in the super ego too. And creepy when it actually does work. Yes. Yes. Useful. Yes. Very useful. And your super conscious. Okay. Which is we've one we've seen before here is the wanderer. Mm hmm. Is it, wasn't that, uh, that, that was, was Natasha's, Natasha's uh, super conscious, wasn't it? No, it's, no, it was her super ego. It was, it was yeah, her it was super ego. Them, yeah. So this is your, this is who you are in the process of becoming. So now we got to be, we got to talk a little bit about this one. Okay. Because um, this is a person, um, it, when it, when it, when it's reflected in the super conscious, when you're talking about um, oh, the wanderer, um, I mean, a fearless defender and unintimidated and fierce. It, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that, I mean, that's the warrior of uh, the, 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 this is the charismatic energy. Sorry. The fearless heroic instincts <laughs> that create yeah. the unwillingness to settle. Um, the danger to this one. Okay. The danger to this one is that you are um, at risk for uh, scattering your energy. And, and not holding right. it together. So you can expend energy very quickly. The wanderer is somebody that can expend a lot of energy very quickly and you can burn yourself yeah. out. Okay. Chronic uh, fatigue syndrome. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so I think you, I think that is where it comes from. So this is the one that you can change. And honestly, that is one that I would say that you should. Okay, I would say that is one yeah. that you might want to work on developing out of your system and try to move it into something that is a little bit more fundamentally like try to push the your id into the super conscious position because you have a wonderful id. There's a lot of it's funny because in parallel, your id is very strong, but you're 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 moving into a weaker position. So try to reverse that. Yeah. Try to do some inward work and try to bring out some of that internal strength so that you can um, maybe convert some of that wandering energy into something that's a little bit more stable. Because the wanderer is not really stable energy. It can sometimes produce some good things, but yeah. it's not necessarily something you want there because it can lead to problematic situations, as you know. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. So you've got your homework. You do. Any questions about it? Be yeah. God, you know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go buy the deck and I'm going to be studying. Honey, I think we're all going to buy the deck. <laughs> Nick, <laughs> Nick Bantek. Well, and remember, he's so got another deck coming out too. He's got another one coming out I later did, this year. Yeah, so. I, did, I did post the link up thread somewhere. You can find it on Amazon. Okay. I forgot the name yeah, of it. I bought it. I you already bought it. <laughs> oh, <it's> <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Danielle, for calling in. Thank you very much for taking my call. Yep. Really yeah. enjoyed that. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks again. Take care, hon. Okay, let's go ahead here. This is from, oh, it's a local, 678 from Georgia. Hello, you are on the air. Hello, 678. Sorry. Hi. Hello. Oh, that's my friend, Jen. Oh, Jen. Okay. All right, Jen. So let's go ahead and uh, same routine as before. I want you to hold in your mind very, very clearly, um, very intently, your knowledge of self and that you want this deck to reveal to you your authentic reality. Okay, hold that intention, hold it strong in your mind as if there's nothing else that matters right now than to have this reveal the truth of who you are. The stronger you hold that, the more accurate this is going to be. And then when we get to that point and we're already there, now go ahead, release it to the abyss. Just go cast it out into the darkness and now have that darkness replace itself with a bright, shining luminosity, a wonderful, warm and pleasant white light that envelops you. And now that is the only thing that matters. The intention's gone. The intention's forgotten. You're not even thinking about it. It doesn't exist. All that matters is the white light now. Just consume yourself in that white light. 
And let's repeat the mantra Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Parasam, Gate, Buddhi, Soha. Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Parasam, Gate, Buddhi, Soha. It's a wonderful, wonderful mantra from the Vajrayana school of Buddhism. Um, one that I have found to be very uh, insightful for my own spiritual work. It's got a nice work. flow to it. It does, it does. And it is all about release. It's all about abandonment. It's reckless abandonment and getting to the core of truth by uh, uh, releasing all of our attachments. And thus the suffering goes with it. But go ahead and just, and we're there. We are there. Okay, let me cut the deck. Okay, and let me lay out the cards here. So here we go. All right, so let's look at your ego here. Okay, so, oh, this is an interesting ego. Okay, <laughs> so um, what was the, what's your first name again? Jennifer. Jen, okay, Jennifer, yeah. okay. All right, so Jennifer, here we go. Um, it's, it's the trickster, okay? So this is an interesting ego. Um, let me read my notes here. So this is this is ex, uh, uh, this is a person who experiences ego deflating synchronicities that serve to guide and awaken you. So typically, a person with this influence has had a very difficult life and has a lot of struggles that have served as lessons that needed to be learned, but usually at the expense of a lot of happiness. So the trickster is a very difficult ego to have. Um, it is somebody that struggles, but uh, it's also somebody that um, is, a, is, a, is a learner. I mean, it's an education experience, but maybe not necessarily ones you've wanted to go through. Some people can experience this with a lot of anger. Some people can experience it with, uh, you know, lesson learned, never do that again. Um, sometimes it's a combination of both. Go ahead and, uh, Jamie, read uh, what the trickster the is. If the tr trickster is close by, whether you like it or not, the trickster is close by, whether you like it or not. Uh, it's really hard to see. Yeah, I know. It's dark. He knows here. about your propensity for self-delusion and refuses point blank to let you indulge self-aggrandizement. If you're heading in the wrong direction, he will tie your shoelaces together. <laughs> and if you become arrogant, he'll show you your absurdity. He is a thorn in your flesh, an utter nuisance, and he is absolutely essential to your well-being. This is, this is uh, usually somebody that, again, it's somebody that struggles a great deal with um, challenging events and... Uh, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's kept you perhaps more humble than you ordinarily would have been because, um, they can be very, like I said, ego deflating experiences. And let's look at the super ego to see if there's any wisdom there that can help to kind of explain where some of that came from. So you get the midwife as your super ego. This is the one that, that uh, was imprinted upon you by other people and how other people tend to see you. And this is, um, interestingly enough, uh, associated with the Empress in the Major Arcana. It, there's a great deal of feminine and motherly instinct in this um, and the wisdom that this provides. So this can manifest usually in two ways. Either you yourself are a person that connects very deeply with feminine energy and is a very, a very motherly maternal person, or um, your mother was of significant importance in, in, in your development, either in some form or fashion that she played a role in who you are today. Um, and that is now um, kind of a, uh, an expression of how you how other people see you today as kind of an expression of uh, that individual so it could be one or the other that's usually how this manifests but it's very strong um feminine energy um very powerful feminine energy um sometimes it can manifest as feminism itself but in many cases it's basically just femininity in its strong sense not in the sense of how the world tends to see it as a weakness um it, it's more of in the sense of the the power of feminine energy the power to create the power to nurture um the power to embrace and and experience emotion um and um all of the attributes that that can um contain so what's the book say the midwife draws from a deep font of female knowledge she is a facilitator the mother to your muse and an advisor to your craft she will help you develop the lucidity of your language give rhythm to your music and breathe vibrancy into your painting with her guidance your works will be filled with vitality but without her your attempts of creation will be as dead as the day as the clay golems oh my 
Okay, so let's look at now the id. Here's your dirty laundry card. Okay, so um, I can barely see it here. Okay, intimate. The card is the archetype of intimate or intimacy. It is the lust card. It's a manifestation of the lust card, also in some decks called strength. But in the Crowley Toth deck, it's called Lust. It's one of its manifestations. Very sensual uh, and emotional longings with this card. So um, this typically produces subconsciously a very passionate, emotional person. Um, very strong sexual libido, um, typically. Um, and usually from very early in life that that developed uh, because it is the id. You're talking about the deepest, most passionate, most intimate longings of the subconscious mind and can be very difficult to control. However, because your superconscious is the mother, you can manifest that in more useful ways than some people might, you know, abuse this energy because it can be so powerful and so can control them. Um, but you got that trickster there too. And the ego that can be troubled. Th this combination can be very difficult. Fortunately, you have that mother, that mother can kind of keep things a little bit more in line. But um, I would imagine that you are a person who can sometimes be at odds with yourself because of these conflicting energies. Um, <laughs> I've known her for a long time. I'm not, I'm not going to give anything away, okay. but so far it's been pretty damn accurate. Okay. Um, <laughs> the intimate, the intimate brings sweet sensuality and an intuitive understanding of your emotional and physical needs, moods, and temperature changes. She has an infinite capacity for understanding your longings, whether it be sensual, erotic, or merely a need for a gentle comforting of your weary spirit. The intimate comes to you without artifice and your night embrace is a sweet honeycomb tongue. Well, there you go. All right. So let's see who you're becoming spiritually. Okay. Because all of this is very interesting energy. And uh, honestly, we've seen this archetype in you. So this might be where you guys have compatibility. Yeah, we, we've known each other since 2002, 2003. The healer. So basically uh, what this is, now this is very important because now we've already seen a bit of the story unfold here. So the healer is one, again, that's learning to heal or, or suffer the consequences of not doing so. So she offers a choice, okay? And what that means is because of the trickster presenting you with a lot of difficult scenarios, because of this strong, passionate, emotional energy, because of all of this, 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 uh, the, the very, again, motherly energy can, there's also a lot of emotional connection there. Um, this can mean that there's a lot of hurt that needs to heal in order to spiritually advance, or you will succumb to those emotional deficits and not progress, which would mean that there's more lessons to learn. Um, so you want to kind of get it right in this life. Um, I would say that this is a very good card to, to, to hold on to, a very good archetype to strive for because you need healing in your life. And I would say that the fact that this is showing up now means that you haven't really done enough of that and you need more of that in your life. You need more healing. I don't think yeah. we need to read from the book because we've... Not. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Hi, I just said, yep, just starting that. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, uh, the archetypes never lie, but they uh, sure don't. Um, I think that that um, hopefully that was meaningful to you. It was. Thank you. You're very gives you a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, at least, you know what to do, what to hold on to, what not, you know, what not to let go of. Okay. So here, here's the situation. We've got a bunch of people still on the line here and we are now at the end of the show. So here's what I'm going to do for those of you who are on the line right now. Okay. I want you to call back next week. Okay. During the questions from the ether segment, we will take one question from the ether. Okay. Just to satisfy that. Cause there's always questions coming in. Brandon, you only have to find one. Um, <laughs> and we will do your readings. Be prepared for a couple, just in case people, these people don't call back because there's a bunch of them here. Um, and some of them might, call, might not call back. I don't know. Maybe they all will, but we need to be prepared for that segment in case they don't. So have a, be armed with a few, but you really only need one and call back 
next week during the first hour and I will do another one of these readings, okay, for you so that you don't miss out. I don't want anybody to miss out and I can see that there's this was a very popular show. And if I had known that <laughs> we don't usually get so many callers, yeah. if I had known um, that so many people would call, call in, I would have probably done this show earlier. I'd like to give the uh, author a shameless plug. I, yep. There is the, the link to the Amazon um, page where this is available. It's called the Arkeo deck yep, by Nick Bantock. Nick Bantock, yep. And he's got another one coming out. I'll try to go back into my emails and find out the name of that so I can talk about it. Those of you who are on the line, remember, call back next week at the first hour and I will take your call and I will do this reading, okay? Um, I think that's it. Next Thanks, week, everybody. That was a good one. It was a good one. Next week, we've got uh, Michael Van Own, my good friend, Always to good talk to about Michael. ego reality, which leads right into this. So, I think this should be a good continuation. Honestly, this makes sense to do more of these readings next week and, um, and we'll see what comes of it. Okay. Until then, take care. God bless. And I'll see you out there in the ether. Take care, everybody.